Thank you very much, Dr. Ravi. Our dynamic secretary of Indian Poetic Association, Dr. Rajiv Saxena, mm. is a most dedicated person for the diabetic foot, and he is making much awareness program in the public to make them aware, which is the most important for prevention of diabetic foot. The Indian Podiatric Association has the chapter has been formed in Rajasthan also, and we have got a very Ram Chandani, who is taking care and devoted for type one diabetes, and also he has got uh, diabetic foot cleaning. So he is also taking uh, the uh, care for diabetic foot. He is the on he is the chairperson of Rajasthan chapter of. Also, uh, uh, Indian Pediatric Association, and Dr. Puneet Saxena is professor of medicine, and he is also a very dedicated person, enthusiastic person, and he is running diabetic foot clinic at his home. The joint secretary of our the the Haryana chapter chairperson, Dr. Sandeep Suri. Is also making people aware in the Haryana state, and he is also devoted person for diabetic foot. Dr. S. S. Darya is an assistant professor, associate professor of medicine, and he is one of the most dynamic and uh, enthusiastic person, and he is also working greatly for diabetic foot. So all of them are making this. Association very vibrant to make aware and educate the patients and also our clinicians because you know clinicians we have to remove the clinical inertia we get ex, uh, evaluate for blood a diabetic patient comes we evaluate him for blood sugar level we evaluate for cardiovascular problems or uh, hypertension, we will wait him for kidney diseases. So, but we forget to examine his foot, which is very important. Unfortunately, the amputation in diabetic foot are almost equal to accidents. And fortunately, they can be prevented by just when you examine feet for the first time when patient comes to you, or even if you don't have time, you ask your educator, to do it this uh, foot examination who can be trained. And it takes hardly two to three minutes, but you prevent it. Another thing, the smoking. Smoking is one of the most important reason for PVD and this uh, diabetic neuropathy, which should also be you convinced to the patient that you should not smoke. So all these things are very important because it is a preventable, otherwise it costs so much. Diabetic food costs so much that one cannot afford. So with this view, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Suri and Dr. Rajesh Saxena, under the banner of Indian Podiatric Association and Vocard Diabetic, I thank Dr. Vocard also for organizing this webinar and under the leader, under the banner of Indian Podiatric Association in collaboration with Vocard, we have got today very important, educative and meaningful webinar. So friends, enjoy it, learn it, and update yourself in diabetic food, which is most important part, but unfortunately, which is one of the most neglected part. Even in, con in conferences, the either the, the lecture of diabetic food is kept in the last or in the early. So, it is very important to update yourself for diabetic food. So I will not, I have taken much time and I will uh, hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ram Chandani, who is a moderator of this conference and he will proceed with the session. Thank you very much again for attending this conference. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. And in fact, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Vocard and entire team of dynamic team of Vocart and IPA president, uh, Dr. Suri. So now we are going to start uh, the uh, CME program and we have six lectures and uh,
the first lecture is the most important part in the uh, diabetes that is a management of painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy diabetic foot as a neuropathy vascular and vascular and neuropathic part as well as infection there are three most important part in there and uh, for that we have the renowned speaker from uh, jaipur uh, dr puneet saxena dr puneet saxena is the honorary secretary of rajasthan chapter of uh, indian podiatric association last year where rajasthan chapter was formed at ajmer in november in the presence of dr sudhir bhandari sir and uh, he is the organizing secretary of uh, national epicon 76 national epicon 2020 which is going to be held at jaipur in january he is a various 21 2021 and he is a senior professor and unit head of medicine sms medical college and hospital jaipur and he is a fellow of uh, royal college of physician edinburgh he is a fellow of rss di he is a fellow of indian college of physician fellow of diabetes india gsi fiscm and uh, uh presently is the vice chairman of uh, rsj rasan chapter and uh, he has a post gives teachers and guide and he has a various publications in international and national uh, journal and reputed journals and he is a faculty of phfi also and ccbdm so there long list of dr puni saxena's uh, cv so i am not taking the much time i and i request dr puni to kindly start the session and kindly enlighten, enlighten us about the diabetic peripheral neuropathy dr puni saxena thank you very much uh, good evening everybody and uh, i uh, at the very outset i pay my regards and gratitude to dr k k parikh sir under whose patronage the various associations and in medical association in india has flourished over the past few years or rather decades and the association of physicians of india uh, rssdi and the now the ipa that is the indian podiatry association which the, uh, is growing under the patronage of parik sir and uh, similar same time i want to pay thanks to dr aps suri and dr rajesh saxena who floated this state chapter of uh, ipa in rajasthan last year with uh, dr gd ramchandani at the helm as the chairperson is a very dynamic person in the field of diabetes and we have a young dynamic team with me with dr darya dr sori and other people and we look forward to develop this uh, state branch of ipa into a happening one and do too much of academic activity and awareness and improvement of diabetic foot management in near future so with that i also want to thank uh, Vocard also, who has uh, taken time and has taken pains to manage this uh, CME. And without further delay, I switch to my presentation for today, which is basically on management of neuropathy. So we all know that. Can I have my slides, please? So we all know that diabetic neuropathy is basically the harbinger or the 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 center point for development of diabetic foot. So if you have a bad nerve supply or sensations to the foot, or if you have a bad vascular supply, then in the presence of diabetes, your the feet of the patients are jeopardized, and diabetic neuropathy it plays the maximum havoc. And as Dr. Parikh has said, that it is the most neglected part. of the diabetes management as such but it carries too much of morbidity and mortality where you will find that amputations do happen and people lose their quality of life and sometimes life itself because of the diabetic foot which eventually develops because of diabetic neuropathy so can i have my slides please yes yeah, sir yes yeah, sir just a minute sir nature uh, can you just play so now it's saying yeah please move on yeah. next please next so diabetic neuropathy is basically a descriptive term meaning go to the previous one go to the pre 
is a descriptive term meaning demonstrable disorder either clinically evident or subclinical that occur in setting of diabetes mellitus without is not without other causes of peripheral neuropathy the neuropathic disorder includes manifestations in the somatic and or autonomic parts of the peripheral nervous system and please note that this autonomic part is often it's not often but most of the time not taken care of and it is not recognized next please so we all know that the incidence and prevalence of diabetes is rising globally and it is unfortunate that in india is showing the highest number of china and that we are projected to be the world capital of diabetes and if you can see here that idf has projected 450 million approximate patients in 2030 and all forms of diabetes of sufficient duration are vulnerable to develop peripheral neuropathy and if you see the prevalence of diabetic peripheral neuropathy it can range from 5% to 100% and this data comes from various prevalence studies which have been shown in diabetics across and one of these pirards cohort of 4500 diabetics has shown prevalence of 45 year 45% after 25 years of diabetes so the number of diabetics are increasing globally and so is the very high number of neuropathy now the problem statement is that the neuropathy can occur with impaired glucose tolerance and metabolic syndrome even when the frank diabetes has not developed and the most common form of neuropathy in the developed country is the diabetic neuropathy nowadays and it is responsible for 50 to 75% of non trauma amputations and probably it is matching or probably it has exceeded the amputations which are happening because of trauma and the major morbidity which comes in is the foot ulceration gangrene and limb loss which the ipl most interested in and wants to address this problem of neuropathy also so that the etiology of diabetic foot development can be addressed at the very early stage now you can see that amputation risk is 1.7 fold and and it becomes 12 fold if the deformity is present in presence of neuropathy and if 36 fold if there is a history of ulceration next slide please so these are the risk factors for development of diabetic neuropathy you they you can have modifiable risk factors meaning by that you can control these you can have good glycemic control avoidance of alcohol control of hypertension avoidance of tobacco and dyslipidemia these are modifiable risk factors and you see on the right hand side the non modifiable risk factors are there obesity is mentioned i think obesity is a modifiable risk factors and most of the time it can be modified also age sex family history long duration of diabetes they cannot be modified l dose reductase gene hyperactivity cannot be modified and that is why we use l dose reductase inhibitors for controlling the complications and similarly the angiotensin containing enzyme genotype can be responsible for you know development of diabetic neuropathy next please you see hyperglycemia it increases the endoneural vascular resistance and reduces the nerve blood flow the blood flow that is the vedana nervosum is altered and the blood flow is altered there is depletion of nerve myoinositol by competitive uptake and activated protein gain c there is activation of polyol pathway in the nerve tissue through aldose reductase accumulation of sorbitol and fructose non enzymatic glycolysis of structural nerve protein happens and glucose auto oxidation leads to toxic reactive oxygen intermediates and all of them can lead to structural and functional damage to the nerves next slide so if you see diabetes then autoimmunity hyperglycemia coupled with hyperinsulinemia disorders in the growth factors and dyslipidemia and third modality is the microvascular malfunction so combined all these three pathways ultimately lead to structural and the functional nerve damage which happens in the diabetic neuropathy and i'm not going into the details next slide please so this is how the diabetic peripheral neuropathy is developing the healthy tissue is there and then you see that diabetes related metabolic or vascular uh, conditions can cause capillary damage or rather it causes capillary damage and when the capillary damage starts then you have abnormal neuronal function especially in the extremities and it leads to abnormal sensations and this 
uh, progresses and you will have a frank neuropathy development over the period of time in diabetes. Next, please. So if you see the classification in brief, so it can be a diffuse neuropathy where it can be a diabetic symmetrical polyneuropathy or it can be a mononeuropathy or it can be a neuropathy. Now, if you see the diffuse neuropathy, which are the commonest neuropathy, you will find that DSPN, that is the distal symmetric polyperiphal neuropathy is the most common and it can be either primarily small fiber or a large fiber neuropathy. And most of the time it is the mixed involvement of the both the small and the large fibers. Whereas you can have autonomic dysfunction where you will have either cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, urogenital or pseudomotor involvement. Next slide please. If you see mononeuropathies, then isolated cranial or peripheral nerve involvement, third nerve involvement, cranial nerve third involvement is a very problematic thing which we see because of vascular involvement in diabetes. So similarly, ulnar, median, femoral, or any other nerve can be involved and it can present as a mononeuritis multiplex also. And we also come across radiculopathy and polyradiculopathy where you will feel that the plexus neuropathy, radiculoplexus neuropathy, like lumbosacral or even brachial or polyradiculopathy can be seen and you can have sometimes thoracic radiculopathy before the diabetes. Next, please. Now we come uh, to the most common presentation that is the distal symmetric polyneuropathy. It is the uh, responsible for accounting for almost 75% of diabetic neuropathies. And most patients with DSP and have a mixed variety of neuropathies with both large fiber and the small fiber in the diabetes. And a glove and a stucking distribution of sponsory loss is almost universal. And a combination of typical symptomatology and symmetrical distal loss or typical signs in absence of symptoms in patients with diabetes is highly suggestive of DSPN. Next slide, please. So if you see the distal symmetric polyneuropathy, the subtype, the large fiber is characterized by deep-seated pain, that is the A-type, wasting and weakness, numbness, pen needles, tingling, ataxia, impaired vibration perception and position sense, loss of reflexes, impaired nerve uh, conduction velocities, interference with normal life, and the risk of falling in fact, whereas you see the small fiber then the pain is superficial. Electric shock and burning type of sensations are present. Allodynia is there. Autonomic dysfunction sets in here with the small fiber involvement. Thermal imperception is there. The strength in the reflexes, they are maintained till late. And it is electrophysiological silent in the initial stages. And it leads to symptoms. And finally, it can also lead to morbidity and death. Next slide. So what is the sequelae? Sequelae is that DSPN is the most important cause of foot ulceration. If we are interested in as a member of IPA okay. here and we are dealing with the foot, mm -hmm. it is also a prerequisite in the development of charcot neuroarthropathy. And it is a major contributor to falls and fractures to more advanced small and large angle dysfunction, which can lead to injuries to the foot and the lower limbs also. And with loss of sensory, proprioception, temperature discrimination and pain, all ultimately leads to unsteadiness Recurrent minor injuries and increased risk of falls. Next slide. We need you to finish early. Yeah, I, I'll just take five Next. minutes. Con concept of pain in diabetic neuropathies. Approximately 10% of patients patient with diabetes experience persistent pain from neuropathy. And pain syndromes that last less than 6 to 12 months are classified as acute, while those lasting longer than 6 to 12 months are classified as chronic. And the pain may be either ongoing spontaneous or hyper -elvisic, where increased response to a painful stimulus is seen and it can be severe and intractable. Concern. Next slide, please. So the pathogenesis is that there is a central sensitization at the level of dorsal horn and spinal cord. There is increased excitability at the sinus, the recruitment of several threshold inputs, amplification of noxious and non-oxygen stimuli, loss of inhibitory interneurons, growth of non-damaged touch fibers and increased concentration of neurotransmitters and wind up caused by an injury. Next slide, please. So acute painful neuropathy, predominantly the small fiber neuropathy, manifested by pain and paresthesia in early in the course of diabetes, and it can be present with the onset of insulin therapy and has been termed as insulin neuritis. And symptoms often are exhibited at night and manifested in feet more than hands, and the pain has been variably described as burning, lancinating, stabbing of sharp, Whereas these are episodes of distorted sensations such as pins and needles, tingling, coldness, numbness, or burning, often accompanying pain. 
and pain often occurs at the onset of disease and is often worsened by initiation of therapy, whether it is the sulfonylurea or insulin. Next slide, please. If we talk about the chronic painful neuropathy, onset is later, often years into the course of diabetes, and pain persists for more than six months and becomes debilitating. Can this condition is resistant to narcotics and analgesics, and finally results in addiction. And it is an extremely resistant to all forms of intervention, and most frustrating for the patient and physician to treat. And patient with chronic neuropathic pain usually present with both positive and negative symptoms, which can be present simultaneously. And absence of pain sometimes is not from improvement in neuropathy, but is rather a consequence of neural loss finally and a neuropathic limb. Stimulus independent pain includes dysthesia and paresthesia, hyperalgesia, and allodynia. Can be present. Next slide, please. Next. Next. Next, please. Next. So about diagnosis, as Dr. Parikh has said initially in his address, that diabetic foot examination is the best modality which is often missed. Please inspect the foot, palpate the foot, check the pulses, check the sensations. Then uh, there are simple tools like filament test. And if you feel that patient is suffering, then you can go for nerve conduction studies or the further advanced tests to diagnose the neuropathy. Next slide, please. You can go for a quantitative sensory testing. You can go for electromyography if you feel so. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So we come to the manage. No, the previous one. Management of painful diabetic neuropathy. You need to have symptomatic management. Exclude non-diabetic causes first. Malignant diseases, paraneoplastic syndromes, metabolic causes, alcohol, tobacco, HIV infection, any other drug like INH or alkaloids causing the assessed level of blood glucose because you need to have a good glycemic control for better outcomes. Aim for optimal stable control and then consider pharmacological therapy. Next slide. So pharmacotherapy. Pregabalin is the best drug which is recommended as level A, and you can see that it blocks the calcium channels and modulates them. The starting dose you can use to use from one to, from 75 milligram to up to 150 and can go up to 600 milligram. And its dose has to be reduced with the impairment. And a Cochrane wave data has shown that pregabalin was effective at daily doses of 300, 450, and 600, but a daily dose of 150 generally is, is, is oh. effective in a clinical way. It is shown here ineffective, but we find that it probably is effective. Next slide. We need to conclude now. Next, please. Yeah, I'm concluding, sir. So another very good drug is duloxetine. Then you have gabapentin. So these three drugs, they fall into a level A recommendation. Next slide, the, the TCS. We talk about amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Then you can have a symptomatic management where you can use opioids for pain management. These kind of drugs. So addiction problems, side effects can come. Next slide, please. Next. Next slide. So you have topical and physical treatment. You can have topical nitrate, then you can have capsaicin. Uh, you have ointments which can give temporary relief by altering the, uh, based on the gate control theory for pain management. Next slide, please. So you have then alternative medicine which has been tried by the patient like acupuncture, which we are not sure of, but other physical therapies like percutaneous nerve stimulation, magnetic field therapy, and finally, spinal cord stimulation can be there. Next slide. So this is the summary of recommendations. The level A pregabalin is the only drug which is recommended with a recommendation of level A, and probably duloxetine and tricyclic antidepressants comes next, followed by gabapentin and other combinations of opioids, analgesics, topical agents. You can manage painful diabetic neuropathy, which is very important, along with optimal control of diabetes. Next slide. With this, I end my presentation here only. Please, Puneet, thank, thank, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puneet Saxena, for a uh, wonderful 
presentation about the painful diabetic neuropathy uh, because uh, there are six uh, uh, sessions in the today's CME. So we'll take the question answers in the last. If some important question in the chat box or something is there, then we can take in between. Otherwise, in the last, we have kept for half an hour for this discussion part. So we'll discuss in the last. Thank so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Puneet. And thank uh, you very much. So Rajan, can you play the, the speaker slides? I request all the speakers to kindly finish your lecture within time. It is only 13 minutes which are being given. Otherwise, there will be no discussion and no interaction. Because because this is the today's we kept is the name of the CME uh, webinar. Allow is, uh, uh, invite other uh, speaker. Yeah. Uh, now we are moving to the and next. Give uh, a short uh, introduction. Yeah. Now. Uh, uh, I think uh, I request to upload the slide of Dr. Uh, Rajni Saxena, introductory slide. And next uh, lecture is on uh, uh, by Dr. S.S. Daria, because now we are living in the COVID era. Yeah. And COVID is no, not only affecting the uh, uh, pulmonary and other system, but also diabetes. And in diabetes, it also affects the diabetic foot and giving some different presentations in diabetic foot. And so for that, Dr. S, uh, we are, the next lecture is by Dr. S.S. Daria. Dr. Daria is uh, working in SMS Medical College. He's a member of uh, RSA Rasan chapter. He's a joint secretary of Rasan IPA. He's a consultant physician and diabetologist in SMS Medical College. And he's a very young, dynamic uh, doctor and a dynamic person and active in every uh, aspect of the uh, Rajasthan. So I request Dr. Daria to kindly uh, start the session. The topic is overcoming the limitations of diabetic foot and the care during the COVID era. So I request Dr. Daria to kindly start the session, please. Thank you so much, sir, for giving my introduction. First of all, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Parikh, sir. Under his patronage, we will be able to make a Rajasthan chapter of IPA. And I would like to thank Dr. Jiri Ramchandani, sir, Dr. Puneet Saxena, sir, Rajni Saxena, sir, and Dr. APS Suri, sir. I'll be briefing on diabetic foot care in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. As we all know that it's since last December 19, Corona is pandemic. So I will start with my slides. Kindly share my screen share, please. Yeah. So, yeah. diabetic foot, as we all know, this is one of the most common complications associated with the annual incidence rate of 6.3%. Its spectrum includes infection, ulceration, and destruction of foot and toes. Etiology already uh, shared by Dr. Puneet Sakchana said that there is a first and foremost is diabetic in peripheral neuropathy, which uh, by complex metabolic pathway ultimately leads to injury to the loss of sensation, which causes sensation and circulation problems results to increase risk of infection, ulcer and gangrene. So the diabetic foot presents with the uh, initially peripheral neuropathy, then foot ulceration, which leads to infection, which leads to gangrene and ultimately joint deformity occurs. In this COVID-19 pandemic era, it is a global pandemic which already disrupts aspects of local clinical practice there should be two scenarios. It is vital to protect the resources and facilities of hospitals so that they can care for the massive number of persons who is living with the COVID-19. And another important thing is to support people living with diabetes but who have foot problems and treat as many as we can outside the hospital so that risk of COVID will be reduced. So there should be a concept of triage system. This can initially decide whether there is a need for the person with the foot problem to actually visit the clinic or at the same time, inquiry should be made about possible COVID-19 symptoms of cough, sore throat or fever so we can uh, think about the COVID. This can be decided by the from actual referral unit, by the telephonic means or by the telemedic in communication either with the patient 
or with the referral. So now the problems uh, of diabetic foot can be divided in two things. One is non-life threatening and other one is limb or life threatening, which again divides into four parts. First is severe infection, sepsis, ischemia, and acute ischemia. So we'll take these by one. So if there is severe infection, which is recognized by the ulceration associated with the rapidly spreading cellulitis as indicated by these signs like redness, swelling, heat, pain, and complicated by a discharge of pus or black discoloration, or there may be a wet gangrene or gas in the soft tissue, which can be identified by cryptus in the skin. These patient needs urgent surgical drainage in hospital and also needs intravenous antibiotics. So second is sepsis. Severe infection may or may not be complicated by the sepsis, which may be recognized by the flu-like symptoms, confusion or drowsiness. Possible symptoms of sepsis includes temperature more than 37.5 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, pulse rate, there, is, there may be tachycardia more than 90 beats, and there will be respiratory rate is increased more than 20 breaths per minute. These patients should be sent to the local emergency department of the hospitals. If severe ischemia, ischemic rest pain may be present in critical ischemic limb, there is usually areas of necrosis will be present. On checking the foot pulses, there may be absent on Doppler, there is arterial signals in the foot are absent and Berger sign is positive. And with the foot going pale on elevation and red when hung down. So if hemodynamic tests are available, critical ischemia pressure less than 30 mm of Hg and toe systolic pressure will be less than 30 mm of Hg. So for these patients, we need urgent vascular assessment leading to revascularization cold pale pulseless painful limb with paresthesia or more paralysis so they will need immediate referral to the tertiary or secondary hospital for the further management in non threatening diabetic foot. There may be an uncomplicated foot ulcer which are non-infected and non-ischemic ulcer in mild or moderately ischemic but stable feet which are not critically ischemic can be treated at home if there is mild foot infection with superficial ulcers and local and drainage in the diabetic foot clinic only with the IV antibiotics with closed follow-up in the local uh, diabetic foot clinic or the community clinic. The last is acute charcoal foot which should be offloaded by a remo removable cast in the local uh, community clinic. This is preferred to be total contact cast, contact cast with a challenge during the pandemic as it needs frequent visits to the diabetic foot clinic for the change of cost. So it should be treated in the community clinic using local infection, wound care, and pain management guidelines with advice available with the diabetic foot clinics. So we already discussed this diabetes with active foot disease uh, divides in non limb or life threatening or limb or life threatening. So the overall aim is to treat as many foot complications as possible in the community and save precious hospital beds for life or limb threatening complication. And of course, for the management of patient with the COVID-19 infection. So these are 12 tips for diabetic foot care uh, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic at lockdown. All diabetic foot patients should uh, take care about, they should don't walk barefoot at home Please check your feet every day. Put lotion on your feet daily. Wash your feet daily. Move. Yes, it is also important for the uh, circulation, circulatory uh, issue. And also movement will give you the mental health also.
take care of small scrapes, cuts, and wounds, and try to keep your toenails cut. Watch for red spots or bleeding under calluses. Take extra care of active wounds. Make sure your wound is not getting worse, and control your blood sugar. And the lastly, the most important, please don't hesitate to call your doctor. So by this, I end with this presentation. Thank you, everyone, for patient sharing. Ah, uh, thank you, Dr. Daria, for uh, enlightening us uh, the care of diabetic foot in this this during uh, COVID era, in a very short. Uh, time, and you covered all the uh, practical aspects of uh, diabetic foot care. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, clarifying Thank this. You, sir. Uh, and uh, we will keep the question in the last because there are a lot of questions there, especially uh, right, diabetic uh, COVID toes. I will ask in the last. I have in one question in mind. We'll discuss in the last. Now we are moving to the next yes, lecture, sir. which is which is the very very important lecture. And today's. Uh, I can say the keynote address or the IPA care lecture. That is a, uh, the basic aim of this lecture is to prevent amputation. And the speaker for this lecture is not other than uh, the president of IPA, Dr. APS Suri. APS Suri is the uh, uh, president of I I IPA and he is the diabetic foot care specialist. Uh, I request to kindly share the slide of Dr. A.P.S. Suri. So, uh, please share the slide of Dr. A.P.S. Suri in the lecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rajan, the last slide is there. Please share that. The same, the same slide set. Now, first, first slide. Uh, you speak about A.P.S. Suri uh, by that yeah. time. Right. Dr. A.P.S. Suri, uh, does not require any introduction. I think... He is a very committed and dedicated uh, to the patient uh, to how to prevent the amputation. His main aim is to how to prevent amputation. And he is the key ro uh, uh, role or he is the main person who is the brain behind this webinar. And he was uh, asking quite since last many days, why don't we uh, go for this diabetic food webinar? Finally, Dr. Azneesh. Uh, uh, requested Dr. K.K. Parisar and Parisar finally uh, told, why not? Yes, I am ready. Whenever you told me, I am ready. So finally, today's uh, time was decided. And the man behind this webinar is Dr. Suri. He has a great experience in the podiatry in India, which was a, uh, even uh, negl negligible part in the a, a decade behind, 10 years back. And I still remember, because today he is going to discuss about the latest technique for diabetic foot ulcer management and his main focus on hyperboric oxygen and platelet therapy as we know that and, and recent in, in last week in last seven days uh, even uh, very very various centers in the india are using platelets for covid patients similarly he is in diabetic foot also they are using platelet plasma and i still remember that he has presented uh, paper in IDF at uh, Korea uh, about the uh, in the award session and the paper was accepted and he was presented nicely about plated rich plasma in uh, diabetic foot ulcers with please the very good results. So I request Dr. Suri to kindly uh, start the session, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice words. Uh, Dr. Ramchandani sir, and uh, thanks to all my speakers over here, Dr. Parikh sir as patron of IPA, Dr. Ramchandani, Dr. S.S. Daria, Dr. Puri Saxena, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rajni Saxena and Dr. Ravi from USA for joining us in this webinar. As said that we have been working for a long time and to discuss about this webinar to spread education as Dr. Parikh sir had said uh, for diabetic foot care. So if you see here, uh, we all know is, are the slides uh, visible? Yes. Ah, Share the slides of Dr. Suri, please. Yeah. First slide. Yeah. That's okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. So we all know that uh, Corona uh, could be a disaster uh, during this time. And I think what I'm going to discuss uh, today is that how we can prevent our patients from landing up into amputation 
as we said in ipa ipa stands for i prevent amputation so mainly we need to prevent amputation in our patient as far as possible but some patient they require to go into amputation in either a unilateral or a bilateral below knee amputation that we can't prevent but we should try to prevent as far as possible our amputations in our patients and mainly during this corona we should avoid to make uh, do admissions for our patient who are suffering with diabetic foot by good glycemic control by good early intervention in diabetic foot infections giving the good antibiotics doing the treatments even clinic debridements can be done and how we can prevent them from getting into admissions into the hospitals lot of papers and lot of presentations are coming up with uh, foot lesion and covid so most of the patient who uh, they, these are the paper mainly from italy and spain that they are seeing these type of petechial hemorrhages in the subcutaneous tissue in most of the patient who are presenting in the icus or in the uh, critical care and these are mainly because of the thrombosis of the small arteries of the feet because now we are knowing that these uh, uh, corona infection it is mainly attaching to the hemoglobin molecule and that is mainly causing thrombosis in the small arteries and these findings could be because of the mainly because of the vasoconstriction which is occurring in the most distal part of the body if we coming down to prevent uh, amputations we all know lower limb amputation there are more like 10 lakh people globally that lose their legs 2.4 lakh in us and europe in india we are touching at about 80000 amputation among diabetics this is among diabetic population what i written over here that in india per year so we don't have much history into this but mainly we are discussing with vascular society of india and so many people they lose their legs because of diabetes other than accident and trauma but shockingly you can see less than 50% of 50% of the amputees they achieve mobility either because of the cost factor they are not able to uh, get the uh, calipers or these uh, uh, mobile uh, things into their feet where in the smaller cities or because of the cost they are not able to achieve mobility and diabetic foot we all know all over the world even in our country it is the most ha utha nahi re telephone ho to uthaya tha to wo pa ne kaha wo parik sahab ka hai to zara sa der rakh diabetic foot ke ya to meeting meeting mein lag rahe hain kuch bol rahe hain kar rahe the kisi se even if we see this uh, like uh, i in amputation if we have to prevent amputation in our patient there are the two uh, theories behind this one is the toe theory and one is a flow theory this main uh, diagram is mainly from dr armstrong from us he is one of the godfathers of di uh, diabetic foot that if we have to see the ischemia of the foot we need to see the perfusion whenever we have a patient in diabetic foot ulcer or diabetic foot infection we should always check for peripheral vascular disease and we need to see whether patient has ischemia look at the abi index of this patient and then we can save uh, try to save this patient into this and second is the toe theory toe theory means that mainly the circulation which is going to the toe or the neuropathy which is developing in the patient where they are got a insensate foot so neuropathy along with peripheral vascular disease they are the main uh, 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 dilemmas of mainly with patient suffering with diabetes if we look at a stairway for amputation how we have to reduce amputation or prevent amputation in our clinic when a patient is coming to our clinic mostly these people who have got diabetes for 10 years 15 years when they are coming to the physician's clinic or a diabetologist or even to a general practitioner we should always examine two things in the patient one is neuropathy and one is peripheral arterial disease if we can examine these two things into their clinical practices by 10 g monofilament or by our examination of the feet take off the shoes and check them even your staff can check for neuropathy and all doing biothermometer examination doing doppler examination or by our own hands we can just check the dorsalis medius or posterior tibialis artery if they are less we can do a doppler test and we can do the abi index if these two things can be done and then a proper education can be given to the patient how what type of shoes or what type of footwear they can wear into their practices when they are going to the office when they are going to their uh, jobs and even the ladies who are staying at home and we can prevent them from getting into an injury because when an injury occurs in a diabetic foot patient very quickly they get infected and they leads to these type of wounds even a patient who is walking going to the temples or gurdwaras or religious places they sometimes have blisters like this because of the neuropathy and very quickly these ulcers they get infected they develop cellulitis and because of the compartment syndrome in the fourth front part of the foot mainly to the toes they develop this gangrene or ischemia in the feet because whenever the blood circulation is less we all know that these diabetic patient they have some degree of atherosclerosis they have calcification in the vessel so they don't have proper circulation and because of this 
the inf spreading infection, they develop ischemia and that leads to either a dry gangrene or a wet gangrene. So if you can remember this pathway into your clinical practices, you can really save patient at the first intervention here, proper education can be given. If an ulcer has occurred in the patient, you can give proper antibiotics, advise them for dressings, advise them for offloading techniques. You can prevent infection in this patient. You can early examination of peripheral vascular disease can prevent this gangrene and we can prevent this amputation. So I think take home message should be that if we have to prevent amputation, we have to follow this stair cast and we can save these people for this. Most of the patients we see, they have peripheral neuropathy, they have peripheral vascular disease. These two are the part and parcel of the disease process when the patient has diabetes for many years. But also they have altered biomechanics. A lot of patients, they have sometimes they have bunions, they have high arch foot or they have low arch foot. So these type of altered biomechanics, a proper education can be given to the patient. If we have to look for amputation, early identification of neuropathy and PVD, as I said, this is a 10 gram monofilament. You can check, you can with the hand, you can check for Doppler. You can do uh, the examination, palpation of the vessels, Doppler examination, ABI index. Protective footwear is very important. That should be given to the patient if they have to prevent these type of injuries or small injuries to the feet. And foot education is a part and parcel of your clinical practice as you are giving education about diabetes, insulin, hypoglycemia. Foot education should also be given to the patient. If you look at causes for diabetic foot ulceration, trauma is a most common cause. 77% of these patients, they feel the trauma and they have they get trauma, but they don't feel the pain because of the uh, neuropathy. As Dr. Saxena has initially told, that they have small vessel disease, they have large vessel disease, so they don't feel the heat sensation, they don't feel the trauma. Deformity of the feet, like bunions, hallus valgus foot, high arch foot, flat feet, sometimes they have other deformities of the feet, the claw toes, because of the neuropathy, these people are not able to have a proper grip on the footwear and not having the proper good wear, they get into the clawing of the toes and hammer toes, and because of that, they can have the ulceration in the front part of the toes. And this is all because of the neuropathy into this. So critical, this is the clinical triad in 63% of the patient who develop these type of pathways. As I said, structural deformities. Now you can see a lady over here. She has a bunion. She doesn't have any problem in walking. That is there for many years. But because of diabetes, you can see she's wearing a tight shoe. She's developing some ischemia over here at the MTP joint. They can develop here at the fifth MTP joint. So these are the places at the end of the toes where we have to see these patients, examine these patients. And if they have neuropathy, we really have to give them an education how they can prevent these pressure points and that can lead up to the uh, uh, proper uh, uh, care for these patients. Very important thing to also to understand is a Wi-Fi classification. This is a new classification which are, we, we follow that. The W stands for wounds, I stands for leukemia, and FI stands for uh, foot infection. So whenever we see a patient, either he has a no ulcer at zero uh, uh, stage, uh, yeah, he has one scoring which has got a small ulcer uh, without gangrene. Second is a deep ulcer which has exposed to the subcutaneous tissue. Or three is an extensive deep ulcer. Similarly, I stands for infection. Zero is when the API index is less than point, uh, more than 0.8. Uh, uh, one is 0 0.6 to 0.8. Two is 0 0.4 to 0.5 and point, uh, three is less than 0. 0.4. So whenever we follow this ABI index, we know that our wound, whether our wound will heal or not. Suppose a patient has got an ulcer in the front part of the foot and he has a score of 0.6 to 0.9 or grade I as one. So we know that it is a little difficult to heal the wounds. Or if it is zero, we know that this wound will heal quickly with our whatever uh, uh, comprehensive wound care properties we follow. Sometimes we can see our TCPO2 studies also we can do if we have that in our hospital or clinic. Then you can follow with this graph into how what is the classification of this. And similarly, foot infection, where there's no sign of infection, one stands for local infection in the subcutaneous tissue. Two is a local infection going in the uh, deeper than the subcutaneous tissue. And three is a systemic infection like cellulitis or sepsis when we occur in the patient. Looking at the pathophysiology, a patient might have a wound with, without any ischemia and or a, a foot infection, or he has all three, the wounds, infection, and ischemia. So that's why it is very a comprehensive care we have to give to the patient to check for infection, check for ischemia, discuss with our vascular surgeon, and that's how we can take care of the wounds and prevent these patients with uh, antibiotics. 
lot of new treatment modalities are there because of the time i won't be able to cover all of them but few very important ones i want to cover it one is the vac vacuum assisted closure i think all physicians or surgeons looking at here should be in the process of having this unit like kci's unit or vac therapy this is a patient where we do the debridement and bigger wounds we can heal by applying a vac this is a big wound you can see a four foot amputation done we can apply this black colored foam we can make a seal of it and through this seal this tubing goes into this machine which i have showed you and for 6 to 7 days we discharge so this is a big way most of our patient during the covid season in our clinic we are putting most of the patient on back and sending the patient back home for 7 days 8 days they don't need to go to the clinic or to the hospital no patient is admitted in the hospital we this wax and they come after 8 days we open up the and clean the wound and the wounds look like uh, uh, the, the wounds they look like this a clean wound and very quickly we can graft these wounds so you can take care of these vacuum assisted closure and uh, get uh, rid of the patient who getting admitted in the hospital debridement is a very important part you, you see any patient coming to your clinic you should be able to debride them like a surgical debridement we have mechanical debridement with an ultrasonic jet we can apply that on the wound of the patient ultrasonic jet is applied and all the dead tissue the biofilm is getting debrided uh, with this so we can use that this is again a day care procedure you don't need to get admission for this patient enzymatic debride is one which where you can you can use urea and pepin creams and lot of other things are available uh, like purilons like intracite and these things can be used for enzymatic debridement autolytic debridement is a very important thing like hydrogel very cost effective hydrogels are available which we can apply that on the wound and get rid of the necrotic tissue in a very uh, few days of time uh, not a very uh, uh, faster method like surgical debridement but yes hydrogels are very important thing maggot therapy we usually don't use now so you can use any one of them uh, in your practices to debride this ulcer and there's always a myth in diabetic patient that you control you control the sugar first or you do the debridement i think i took a message should be whenever the patient is there you start with the debridement and you should control the sugars the sugars will get corrected in one or two days of time but get rid of this abscess cavity or bacteria or the dead tissue very quickly your sugars will also be controlled like many time we see patients like this with a thick calluses so no need to take them these patient in the hospital or into the ots you can just with a scalpel you can revive them and you can give them a soft, soft soles like this can be given inside the footwear of the patient we see a good compliance when we give these type of soles to the patient with these type of small u pads can be applied at a place where the callus has been taken because offloading is very important so debridement offloading infection control sugar control this all goes part and parcel of the process hand in hand so everything can be done at a physician level at a diabetologist level and that's all we are doing under the indian podiatry association that we are spreading education that how you can do this sometimes a bigger ulcers are come like this where the role of a surgeon or a general surgeon is required you can see this patient was wearing a shoe a tight shoe a neuropathy was there he had diabetes for about 16 17 years his hb adkc when he came to my clinic was something around 11.5 so totally an uncontrolled sugar which has lead to neuropathy and he went to an appellate image and you can see necrotizing fasciitis developing into the foot so immediately we have to get rid of the toe and the same sitting we applied vac so doing the debridement we removed all the dead tissue and we applied vac so three times a vac was applied on this foot and it granulated like this you can see over here a good granulation tissue developed in about 20 days of time and immediately we put in a graft over here so we can save the fifth fourth toe also initially i was thinking of amputating this also but we save that but the fifth toe have to be go so this is how we had comprehensive sugar control he was shifted on insulin uh, put in the uh, uh, on uh, iv antibiotics for about 6 to 7 days and subsequently we were able to save this toe these are some other patients like you can see a burn injury on the foot avi index less than 0.8 sharp debridement was done then daily wash was given with a mycosin solution and we started hpot hyperbaric oxygen therapy in this patient and vac was also applied and this is how in two weeks some a uh, small amount of granulation tissue develop in 3 weeks little more granulation tissue develop and then these are the tendons which uh, we we have little bit debrided these tendon but now we have got a very good thing which is known as uh, derma cell or we have integra like derma uh, these are 
uh, dermal implants which we can apply that over here and even tendons can get granulated and similarly we can gra graft it as well. So hypergaric can be uh, taken up with this uh, patient. This is again one patient having a necrotizing fasciitis in the whole lower part of the leg. This is some of the part has been left over. So IV antibiotics again was given, sugar control was given, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, something like 30 sittings were given to this patient and after that a grafting was done and you can see a good graft which has taken over there. But if I go back to this, so this was at there, we can use hydrogels, we can use some hydrochloride gels over here, over here, and different type of dressings can be tried. And then that's how with a comprehensive wound management, that would have been a very costly affair in this type of patient where you can use these type of things. And there you can see these patients have been healed very well. So at there, something like adjuvant therapies are there in diabetic foot ulcer. So whenever you have a patient, you have a lot of pressings to be done. You can take care of negative pressure therapy. You can have bioengineered skin products like Integra and Dermacell, which I told you. These are now available in India. Initially, we used to get it from uh, USA. So five years down the line, these were not available, but now these are available. A lot of growth factors and PDGF, amniotic membrane products like Amcoplast, they are also available. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy we can do. There are a lot of negative papers which are coming that they don't heal the wounds, but we get very good results. Some shock wave therapy is also available and into this. And these all things, we are adjuvant. Whatever, the bridemen, diabetic foot ulcer care, dressing control, sugar control, and offloading. These are the prime five things how you have to take care of the feet. And with this adjuvant therapy, if you have, you can follow that into your practice. And that's how we can save these patients to getting into amputation. So that is high prevent amputation is there. Again, this is one of the things, PRP, platinum rich plasma. This is uh, doing a good thing. We are practicing that for the last seven, eight years into our practice. Before that, I was doing stem cells and I was taking blood from the bone marrow, sending it to a stem cell bank. We are making the cell lineage and then that was injecting in the wound. But now we have this uh, centrifuge into our clinic. And uh, similarly, in the, it's a daycare procedure. Just it takes a one hour. Within one hour, we can send the patient back home. This is a centrifuge set. We can take 20 ml and 40 ml. There are two sets. One is 20 ml and one is 40 ml. So we can take the uh, blood, patient's blood, centrifuge that at 8,000 to 10,000 RPM. There are different sets, like different companies are available. So you can discuss with your pathologist and that you can uh, centrifuge that. And here we get the buffy coat over there. There are some set where we mix it with, uh, we, we can make the gel of this uh, buffy coat. And these are the platelet rich plasma. This is a plasma rich in platelets and this is all WBCs and centrifuge which goes down. And that we take and that is injected subcutaneously into the wound. The process is the same what is we people are using for COVID. Like they are taking plasma from the infected patient who has got two things, two sets of uh, tests negative and post 14 days post the patient is discharged from the hospital or the two sets are negative. In those plasma, 120 ml of the patient's peripheral blood can be taken of the COVID positive patient. Centrifuge and this is the same plasma which is taken out because this plasma contains antibodies against the corona infection virus and this same whole of the plasma is injected through the IV drip into the patient. So one from the one centrifuge, four patients are being treated in different parts of the country and ICMR has also now approved plasma therapy for uh, corona, corona and a lot of the, today, yesterday uh, night, uh, one of my uh, relative was admitted in Max Hospital in Delhi and we have got the plasma done for one of the patients. Similarly, one doctor from Agra has come and he's got admitted in Delhi and we have done plasma therapy for that patient also. So I'll conclude that is in COVID era, there's a need to change our treatment strategies. That is very important in selectively collecting, uh, selecting our diabetic patient that need to be hospitalized. So I'll say as far as possible, we should prevent uh, hospitalization for our patient. Mainly they require for kidney disease or they require for sepsis, for diabetic foot infection, necrotizing fasciitis. Try to avoid hospitalization because these patients are mainly exposed to this corona infection in the hospital. So we need to try to reduce the risk of COVID infection due to related to hospitalization. This is important. Another thing is diabetic patients with ischemic foot have very high mortality risk related to COVID-19. Therefore, all attempts should be made to prevent infection in our diabetic patient by proper education and good glycemic control. So this is a very important thing. We need to advise patients that need, you need to take good control of the sugar, good education, not to wear, wear barefoot, what type of footwear to wear. If they have small injuries, they can go immediately go back to the doctors and take treatment and try to prevent infections in the foot. 
people with diabetes represents a fragile population that is at increased risk for mortality from COVID-19, and it is advisable to un avoid unnecessary diabetes-related hospital admission to the risk of COVID-19 exposure to the hospital. So this is very important. We need to follow this in our clinical practices, and that's how we can prevent amputation. But I think the core message should be that if we can early identify neuropathy, early identify peripheral vascular disease, good education can be given about foot care. We can. Um, uh, prevent the patient to going into that uh, staircase of infection in, uh, then uh, gangrene development and then getting into the amputation. So that's how proper education has to be given. We can use good techniques of back therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and plasma therapy in diabetic foot infection for early healing for the wounds because most of the patient, they have underlying peripheral vascular disease. We should take uh, uh, help from our vascular surgeon wherever possible uh, in this patient. A, a care of a dietary, a vascular surgeon, and diabetologist. These are very important in taking care of this patient. Thank you so much, uh, and I welcome you all to this uh, center. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. APS Suri, sir, for uh, enlightening us and uh, for a wonderful talk on the uh, today's uh, diabetic uh, di management of diabetic foot by. Uh, plasma and you, I, I already told you that uh, he has presented a paper for that also and with very good results so uh, this is the re recent advances in covid also recent treatment in covid also so we have a lot of questions for you that we'll discuss in the uh, last now we are uh, moving to the next talk and uh, next speaker is uh, dr ravi kamipalli and he's going to speak on the infection control in the diabetic foot and in the diabetic foot there are three things the one is the neuropathy and second is vascular injury and second uh, simultaneously if there is infection it leads to the very horrible situation so dr ravi is the uh, basically he belongs to guntur and uh, he is presently living in the uh, ohio he is a vice president of indian podiatry association and he is a board certified infectious disease physician and epidemiologist. He is a certified wound specialist and the diplomat of American Board of Obesity Medicine. Dr. Kemipali received his medicine degree from the Guntur and he is a fellow of Infectious Disease Society of America for achieving professional excellence in the infectious disease and involved many of the clinical research of 27 clinical, 72 clinical trials. And one of the very uh, nice part of the Dr. Ravi that whenever we uh, call him, he always available and he used to come in India. He is, uh, he, uh, he was there in uh, Ajmer also when the Rajasthan chapter was launched. So I uh, request Dr. Ravi and he is also working in the keto diet and uh, he's, uh, he's also uh, has a lot of publications in keto diet and reversal of the diabetes. So I request Dr. Ravi to kindly enlighten us about the infection control in diabetic foot. Hi, thank you. Um, are you guys able to see, see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So basically, okay. Okay. Um, since the time is short, I'll just make it quick. Uh, thank you, friends. Um, thank you, Amar and the great team of IPA. And uh, we started in 2009 and uh, uh, it has been a good ride till now, and we need to make it great. Um, basically, we're going to talk today about uh, infection and biofilm update. And as you know, the conflicts of interest that I have is mostly to do with uh, uh, removing barriers to infection, wound healing, and obesity. I've been working on some telemedicine solutions for that, including solutions for obesity and uh, wound healing, uh, of course, COVID-19. So. The topic we're going to discuss is what is impairing diabetic foot healing and making those ulcers chronic, and also trying to look at biofilm characteristics in wound care and discuss the role of uh, uh, bacteria. I'll, I'll touch a little bit on uh, international working group uh, for uh, uh, diabetic foot guidelines. So there are five things that we have to really know about diabetic foot ulcers. First thing is uh, they do re-ulcerate. And there is a high risk of that. It happens by 40% in first year and 66% um, in the, in the, in the third, second year. And also by, I think, fifth year, it is almost 75% re-ulceration. 
So they could have a lot of polymicrobial, which could be staph, strep, or anaerobes. But 40% of these diabetic people are uh, having peripheral vascular disease. And the issue is any diabetic can have 25% of incidence in the life. And the cost of uh, this is higher, comes to around 26,000, but I think it's a lot more than that. So, but then on the top of all this, there is going to be a, a disability of uh, having a disease process. So there are four major pillars in chronic wound pathogenesis. Uh, hypoxia, ischemia, reperfusion injury, intrinsic host factors, and we're going to talk about infection and biofilm, but also I want to touch one point on nutrition, which I want to really do a nutrition thing, but I was asked to only do infection and biofilm because of the time. In nutrition, when, when we are doing all this, I want us to really focus on not just the sugar. Uh, there is a recent studies showing that even in COVID, it is not just the blood sugar control, it is also fasting the insulin level. Higher the insulin level, higher the clotting factor because it is noted to show, it is higher insulin levels have been noted to show increased clotting. There is a paper for that. So of course, biofilm we're going to talk is a community of uh, pathogens uh, enveloped in a complex structure of uh, polymers strengthened with metallic bonds. So coming to the role of bacteria, uh, why there's delayed healing is because of the load of bacteria, chronic inflammation, and the different pathogenic strains that talk to each other. Obviously, what happens is when there is this infection, there is host defenses are down and the cytokine production happens. Like, like the cytokine storm, there is also cytokines that are causing the problem in the diabetic foot. So um, basically that was the factor that was used in the, uh, the guidelines, I'll, I'll point it out then. So then also in biofilms, there could be resistance because of to antimicrobial therapy without debridement. And also there could be benign colonizers also. So they, when there is infection, there is no healing. What happens is in infection, you will have a spectrum where it could be uh, contamination, colonization, critical colonization, local infection and systemic infection. But also it is present because of the normal bacteria. So no wound is sterile really. And uh, there could be biofilm, but also there is increased inflammation. So uh, what, are, what, what is the cause of all this problem is because there is in, a prolonged inflammatory phase. The wounds get stuck in an inflammatory phase and then there is not normal clotting mechanism and the white cells are not able to function right. And there is not good angiogenesis and also the granulation tissue is not forming right. So the granulation tissue could be friable and easily bleeding. So in a non-healing ulcer, what are the characteristics? So there is increased proteases, there is increased cytokines like we talked about, but more important also is reactive oxygen species. Amazingly, when the people have bad diabetic control, there is increased reactive oxygen species. And obviously there is increased bio burden. And what this does is, it reduces the cellular activity, prevents the extracellular matrix formation, and also the growth factors are eaten away. So in the, uh, the main etiology, like we said, is that there is increased interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, and there is prolonged inflammation, and also the, the, the proteases are increased, and that inhibitors of these proteases are reduced. So, and the growth factors go down, and the acute wound become chronic wound. That's the underlying uh, pathophysiology in chronic wound. So coming to the biofilm, the, the surf, it is a surface associated microbial community that has many phenotypes and genotypes encased in a three-dimensional extracellular polymeric substances, which demonstrate increased resistance to cellular and chemical attack. So biofilms are not good. What happens when a biofilm is, when the bacteria, one bacteria is there, it's not going to do much of any harm. What bacteria do is they talk to each other by secreting a molecule called uh, homoserine lactone. So if one bacteria is there, it is fine. But what happens is when there's multiple bacteria, they release this homoserine lactone. And when that happens, there is something called as quorum sensing, where you know if you have like uh, only two or three doctors, then it's not a quorum. They, now we have 100 doctors here. There's a good quorum. So if we are learning off each other now. So that is in the same situation, this quorum sensing happens and bacterial inflammation and the toxins start releasing. So in, 
clinical infection in it, what happens with bacteria is uh, because of the biofilm presence, the bacteria overcome host responses and the clinical, normal clinical signs of purulence, erythema, they're not that, that uh, evident. So uh, the, uh, basically the sci clinical signs and symptoms are blunted in diabetes and even in elderly. Coming to the uh, biofilm because of the uh, biofilm, the body is not able to send the response back to that site. So in the biofilm uh, strategy, one and one, one strategy of biofilm treatment is not going to be helpful. Uh, there is need to be frequent debridements and multiple uh, products are now being used, uh, including iodine and silver, which are shown to interfere with uh, cellular processes. And also there are other uh, um, uh, PHMB, uh, polyhexamethyl biguanide, they, and also uh, octinide and uh, benzconium chloride. They are now being used to disrupt cell membranes. And I use hypochlorous acid a lot. And uh, it, is, uh, it is helping interfere with uh, cell uh, bacterial effect on the cell membrane. So there is a new product that they are looking at. It is being worked out. And I think there was a study recently on that. Uh, which contains a topical polyxamer 188. It is like a surfactant and it has no antimicrobial activity. So basically when we are using antimicrobial material, there is always a risk of resistance, but this product they are saying is a surfactant. So it's called polyxamer 188. Now the, the guidelines, uh, international working group guidelines uh, was, were, uh, were formed and I think they were updated late 19 or early 2000, uh, early 2020. Um, in the only major change with this one was, uh, it was in the format of uh, a PICO format where patient intervention uh, comparisons and outcome. And the major changes was whether the inflammation was present. So it is not the inflammation just at the ulcer side, but also inflammation that could be present all over. Um, it, even in, in so if the inflammation is not at the site of the ulcer too, then the foot was supposed to be become inflamed. So, and obviously the major difference in this table that I'm trying to show is we know that uh, in stage one, there is not much of a, a local symptoms, but as we go to stage two, there is a, a skin and subcutaneous changes, but the only major thing what they changed is uh, for stage three and four, they took out osteomyelitis and they said, okay, you put a O for osteomyelitis behind uh, stage three and four if you think there is osteomyelitis. And the only difference being stage four is becoming systemic. So now uh, that, that is a major difference. And obviously we know about the, the serious diabetic foot infection with cellulitis and local signs and systemic complications. And uh, obviously the managing uh, uh, stages that uh, Dr. Suri talked about earlier. So, uh, the antibiotics, uh, mild, uh, we, mostly the staph bacteria is involved. Penicillin, clindamycin can be used. And in MRSA, uh, vancomycin, Zyvox can be used, doxycycline. And uh, uh, of course, if there is a com combination picture, then second or third generation cephalosporins. And we need to look for uh, whether, if there is maceration, uh, see if there is pseudomonas or ESBL, gram negative rods and the antibiotics accordingly with carbapenem. So this is a little complex slide, but uh, we know the workflow. So assessment of a patient is very important, assessing the diabetic uh, situation, neuropathy, like Dr. Uh, Puneet talked. And also uh, basically vascular status is very important. Like I said, vascular status affects 40% of the patients and most of uh, our Indian population, we don't get good uh, vascular evaluation and treatment. And that is very important. And uh, trying to then figure out if there is a clinical infection, then if it is severe infection, obviously we need to admit, and then we need to go through the workflow, try if they're improving or not improving. And if they are not, try to manage it on an outpatient basis. Now there are different skills being developed with outpatient treatment the, so that the patient don't have to come in, like telemedicine technology is being very much used. So uh, the, the final slide, I just want to talk about the key controversies in diabetic foot infections. So these are 10 of them, wherein um, it's hard to say when in a diabetic foot infection, when it is resolved. So my opinion might be different than yours. 
or depending upon the patient's clinical uh, situation. And also, we don't know how long to treat sometimes, uh, uh, how to treat in uh, like where there is a low income patient or low income countries and what imaging study to do. Should I do MRI right away in a resource poor environment? We don't know. And also, we need to figure out whether we need to do medical treatment or surgical treatment, or uh, we need to understand the concept of bacterial bio burden. Some people might not really understand the concept of bacterial biofilm, and they might say, oh, this is granulation tissue, whereas when there could be bacterial bio burden in the, in the wound bed. So, and now there is new tests that are being done with uh, a molecular genetic and microbial testing, but I'm not sure about the continued higher value for the dollar that we're going to put on it. And also in, including biofilm, there is like a immuno, uh, the fluorescence light. There is now new fluorescence light technique that is being used wherein they've shined the light and then the bacteria can show and they make. But then I think uh, staph and uh, I think, no, sorry, strep and enterococcus are not detected in it. So what is the value of it? So. The question is also then local antimicrobials like I talked earlier. And then uh, we need to be very cognizant of bacterial biofilm and also Hello. understand that. Hello. Uh, yeah, we're good. So uh, understand that in this whole process, in this whole process, we need to understand that it is not about the foot. It is about the whole person. So, I mean, I will take one last minute and I will just move out of my slide here and uh, uh, I, I, if anybody is seeing my uh, background here, uh, where I am here, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here, but I want to show, I, I, I want to promote this concept of what is called as uh, disease triangles, where it is about the environment, the lifestyle, and also uh, the uh, immunology and lipidology, wherein these factors then influence the microbiome of the human being and the microbiology and change the genetic behavior that causes the whole problem. So the concept that I want to promote is not just infection. It's about us understanding this whole uh, etiologies and work together as a team-based approach using people, process, and technology. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Very good. Very nice presentation. Ah, thank you, Dr. Ravi, for a, a nice presentation in a very short time. I know there's a very uh, nice lecture and it required a lot of time, but still you are uh, covered in just 10-15 uh, minutes. So we'll discuss in the last about the biofilm and all these things. Now we are moving to the next lecture that we are living in a different environment uh, in the last two and a half months. And uh, our lifestyle is totally changed, especially diabetic patients. They are uh, living in the uh, in, in house and the physical activity, diet habits, everything is changed. And we are partly in the post lockdown period. So for that, we are, the, the, the next lecture is the balancing the efficacy and safety of diabetes and food care during post lockdown period. And the speaker is Dr. Rajni Saxena. Dr. Rajni Saxena is a very active and dynamic uh, diabetologist. Uh, he's working not only for RSS Day, is on his uh, national level, but also he's the Founder, secretary, and presently secretary of uh, Indian Politic Association, he has a lot many and uh, courses uh, on diabetes and diploma courses and fellowships and diabetes India, diabetic food management, and he's a consultant diabetologist and food care specialist, and he's running a Saxena Diabetes and Food Care Centers at Ajmer, and is a I can say is the only uh, center in the Rajasthan who is dedicatedly uh, working for the diabetic food care. Uh, so I'm not going detail about the doctor's niche because everybody knows about his, his work and his dedication. So I straightforward request Dr. Rajneesh to kindly start the session, please. Hello, hello. Dr. Rajneesh, please. Can and, you hear me? Can yeah, you yeah. hear me? Yes, sir. yes, yes. Start. Yes, sir. Just a minute, just a minute. I, I want to just, I'm uh, trying to share the slides. So, hello, hello, sir. 
इट इज नॉट ओपनिंग एयर नाउ हेलो जब तो डॉक्टर सूरी की करवा दे टॉक क्या था हेलो डॉक्टर सूरी का ओपन एयर सूरी का डॉक्टर अनिश हां आप एक बार शेयर स्लाइड शेयर कीजिए दोबारा से जस्ट ए मिनट सर एक्चुअली नीचे नीचे स्लोगन होगा ना शेयर स्लाइड yes, ग्रीन yes. ओके ओके ग्रीन कलर शेयर स्लाइड का बना हुआ है ना ग्रीन yes, कलर पहले प्रेजेंटेशन को ओपन करिए ये सर इसको ऊपर से क्रॉस कर दीजिए क्रॉस कर दीजिए बस ऐसे फुल स्क्रीन कर दीजिए सर ओके सर ओके नाउ स्लाइड ओपन या 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 ठीक है ठीक है ठीक है चलिए चलो चलो थैंक यू डॉक्टर जीवी रामचंद्र हेलो गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स फॉर थैंक यू डॉक्टर जीवी रामचंदानी फॉर योर नाइस वर्ड्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम वेरी मच थैंकफुल टू डॉक्टर के के पारिक सर फॉर स्पेयरिंग हिज वैल्यूएबल टाइम फॉर दिस Uh, CME from his busy schedule. As you all know, India has large burden of diabetes patient. At present, there are more than 79 million people suffering from diabetes mellitus. It clearly indicates that more than 158 million foot are at risk of developing diabetic foot problem. And prevalence of diabetic foot in India varies from 7.4 percent to 15.3 percent. And shockingly, about more than Two lakh amputation annually estimated in our country. As per then, there is no clear cut data. But according to Vascular Society of India, India Society Association, and Diabetic Foot Society of India, about more than two lakh amputation annually estimated in our country. Now, during COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, pursue a lack of transportation facilities, compel diabetic and diabetic foot patient. not to contact his doctor in person or face to face consultation so it sir i think some there is a some issue uh, can rajan you start sir slide and you start uh, sharing uh, sharing your screen uh, you you said dr rajni your slides are not shared niche se share kar diye nitin mujhe oh. slide denge dr saxena ki actually that uh, 35 mb that is not actually coming. actually uh, uh, doctors uh, dr saxena slide is not connected pehle upload kar dijiye na yaar button on सॉरी फॉर इंटरप्शन सो before short rajnish uh, lecture we are going to discuss about the uh, role of insulin analog for the achieving glycemic control in diabetic foot ulcer patients because in management of diabetes insulin is a, a very uh, important treatment for that uh, speaker is dr sandeep suri uh, sandeep suri is the, uh, the chairman of uh, haryana chapter and uh, he is a very dynamic speaker and uh, uh i request uh, kindly share this uh, yeah. slide of dr sandeep suri please yes sir yes sir he is a senior diabetologist and uh, advanced diabetes and critical care in the holy health hospital in hisar and his regional faculty of ccbdm and uh, ndep impact 
and he's a he's a various research papers published in uh, especially in indian phenotype registry in phase 4 trials and he uh, he's a request kindly uh, share the so, uh, yeah. slide of dr sandeep suri please. so uh, yes, i i request dr sandeep suri to kindly start the session about the yeah. role of insulin in analog in diabetes yes dr. sir suri, please Rajan, I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, please sir, put my slides. Yeah. Yeah. Just Start wait for one. Time. Sir, just so, wait for one minute. Okay. I am just putting the slides. So, good evening, friends. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. My heart. Yes. My heartiest thanks to organizing committee, Dr. K K Parikh sir, Dr. Ravi, Dr. G D Ramchandani sir, Dr. Saxena, and my friends, Dr. Ranish, Dr. A P S. I feel highly privileged. and pleasure to be a part of this prestigious ipa update the topic of my deliberation is the role of insulin analogs for achieving glycemic control in diabetic foot syndrome uh, let me have my slides yes sir so the friends the indications of insulins in type 2 diabetes are absolutely clear and everybody knows it and the concept is very clear first slide plus sir uh, yeah first slide yeah this is first slide next 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 next, next, next 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 yeah so indications are absolutely clear the treatment naive patient who coming to you for the first time a1c more than 9% fbg 250 mg ppg 300 to max high very high blood sugar load ketonuria catabolic state losing weight polyuric patient pregnant lady planning for pregnancy so absolutely there is a need of insulin but in patient who are on already on oads not achieving a1c goals despite giving two or three oads with adequate compliance and adequate dose with organ dysfunction specifically liver and kidney deranged medical and surgical illness patients specifically like diabetic foot syndrome patients or patients in sepsis or life endangering conditions we always go for insulin next slide so you can encounter hyperglycemia in a hospital patient in various format and various phenotypes phenotypes can be there that previously it can be a previously diagnosed patient with diabetes you already know that this patient is diabetic previously undiagnosed diabetic patient who is fitting into the diagnosis of diabetes but it was not known before coming to the hospital or patient is having stress induced hyperglycemia that is Uh, fpg higher P rpg are also in the range of diabetic but a1c is less than 5.7% and post discharge they patient these patient went into normal glycemia as the stress is being uh, removed but the maximum next slide next hi uh, yes the next the maximum chunk of such type of patient is hyperglycemia that is induced due to stress which can be triggering which can be triggered due to many factors like it can be in an injury trauma hemorrhage ischemia or it can be surgical stress specific also anesthetic agents can increase blood sugar levels there can be critical illness related stress metabolic stress and severity of the disease itself all these thing can contributes to both endogenous and exogenous derangement endogenous derangement has been clearly uh, alluded to you from dr ravi already that there can be increased counter regulatory hormones like glucagon catecholamines cortisol and growth hormones all leading to increase insulin resistance increasing hepatic glucose output ultimately leading to hyperglycemia sometime you uh, require medications like steroids some tpn enteral nutrition all can lead to hyperglycemia certain therapeutic measures can lead to hyperglycemia so hyperglycemia itself can lead to circulatory and electrolyte effect and also tissue related problems but the more important that tissue related problem like reduced nitric oxide endothelial dysfunction platelet activity that has been already alluded to you from dr ravi immune dysregulation syndrome like cytokine uh, storm and mitochondrial injury or endothelial endothelial uh, impairments or end, uh, endoplasmic reticular stress and leading on to multi organ failure but multi organ dysfunction so these are the factors which are very important in diabetic foot syndrome as they can lead to poor or delayed wound healing progression of worsening of wound course markedly increasing morbidity and mortality 
Now, surprisingly, this mortality is highest in newly diagnosed hyperglycemic patient in comparison to those patients who are already known diabetic. Maybe the body organs are in a stage of well adaptation stage in diabetic patients in comparison to those patients who are having hyperglycemia new onset. Next, next slide. But the concept or basic principle of hyperglycemia management in in-hospital setting remains same as in these patients, you require the goal of insulin therapy is to reach acceptable glucose targets in the shorter duration of time with minimal incidence of hypoglycemia. Once admitted to the hospital, patient with hyperglycemia should be managed using either IV or subcutaneous insulin algorithms. Most treatment algorithms remain, recommend discontinuation of anti adaptic drugs, or we, uh, we will be discussing how to manage these OADs also, and initiation of insulin analog therapy. This is being recommended. Insulin is the preferred agent for glycemic control in hospital patient and two very important pleiotropic effect of insulin in such type of patient is one is it is an anti-inflammatory uh, hormone and also it is an anabolic hormone maintaining positive nitrogen balance and that leads to decrease in stress and improves wound healing also. Next slide. So the, for the insulin therapy in critical ill patient or is specifically surgically ill patient or patient who are in medical ICU we always look at NICE sugar study. It was the largest trial, including uh, till date, including more than 6,000 patients, and it had two arms. One was, one was uh, intensive treatment group, another was conventional group. Intensive treatment group achieved blood sugar uh, around 115, that is 115 milligram, whereas uh, conventional group had achieved blood sugar level of around 144, and look at all cause mortality. It was significantly decreased in those patients who are having uh, who were in conventional group, uh, group due to six-fold higher risk of severe hypoglycemia in intensive group. So we have to follow a policy of do no harm. Next slide. Yes, the targets to be remembered in hospitalized patients are very crisp and precise that in critically ill patient, the threshold to start insulin is 180. If And the target to be achieved is uh, 140, it should be around 140 or not more than 180. It should be in between 140 to 180. In non, those patients who are non-critically ill patient, pre-meal insulin or fasting, in, uh, pre-meal blood sugar or fasting blood sugar of less than 140 and random blood sugar not more than 180. Next slide. Also very important to look here that in diabetic foot syndrome, we have to be more and more prescribed precise and to uh, just classify the uh, degree of damage, degree of uh, inflammation, degree of infection, severity of infection. This has been already alluded to you from Dr. Ravi that infectious disease, it's and international working group guidelines that how to uh, uh, classify these patients, whether they are fitting in, whether they are, this is uninfected patient or milder infection or moderate severity or severe patient, depending upon perfusion, extent, size, depth, tissue loss, and infection and sensation uh, grades. So they are, these are previous grades. This has to be looked at the very onset in your patients. And important dictum that has been already alluded to you doctor, from Dr. Ravi, that to look at a patient as a whole, not only at the hole in the foot, try to make it, whether it is a limb-threatening infection or a li life-threatening condition, so in both situations, you have to admit your patient in ICU setting and manage like any other critical illness. Next slide. So now we are going to discuss first about the management of hyperglycemia in patient of diabetic foot syndrome with, without those who are not in a septicemic or organ dysfunctioning stage. Next slide. So what are the available insulins to us to control postprandial hyperglycemia? Next slide. We have got human insulin like regular insulin to control fasting plasma glucose. You have got insulin like an intermediate acting NPH insulin and also analog insulin for postprandial control like Lispro, Aspart, Glulysin. Now you have got ultra fast acting insulin analog, which I, we are using. We are going to discuss something about that. And also analog insulin of second, third generation and now fourth generation uh, insulin analog long acting is Degludec. So to control both postprandial and fasting glucose, you have got to, again, combination of 
uh, these uh, insulins in the form of either uh, human mixtard or you are having analog insulin like Lispromix, Lispromix 2575, 5050, SPAR3070 or IDEC SPAR3070. Next slide. So all insulins are equally effective. Different forms have been developed to provide options to customize insulin therapy for the different patient need. So this is a basically individualization of your insulin therapy. So now let's discuss those patients of diabetic foot syndrome who are not having any vital organ dysfunction or they are not in septicemic phase. So if this patient is insulin naive patient, so the initiate insulin choice of regimen will depend upon glucophenotype. We will discuss what is this glucophenotype or if patient is already insulin user. So if we have to intensify the in, uh, insulin to get the targets of glycemia control from basal insulin regimen. Sometimes we have to go to premix or you go and go to basal bolus regimen. From premix, we have to go to sometime into basal bolus regimen. Next slide. So for, remember that for normal physiological insulin secretion is exactly mirroring, it is exactly mirroring your glucose in blood glucose, glucose in blood, both at basal and mealtime excursions of glucose, exactly with both basal and mealtime excursions in insulin release from your beta cells of pancreas. Meaning that you always require both basal and bolus component of insulin for an adequate glycemic control. Next slide. But for many time in non-critical situation, we are struck up with two dilemmas. First, which insulin with OADs to initiate, whether it should be basal insulin or it should be pre insulin. Second, what to do with OADs once you are on insulin. Next slide. So you have got lot many OADs uh, nowadays. You have got various classification classes of OADs molecules with you, and they have shown good CVOTs like SGLT2 inhibitors. They have shown very good CV outcomes as per those patients with multiple risk or established CVD patient. But beware, in diabetic foot syndrome, this is a big no for SGLT2 inhibitor patient. Uh, uh, SGLT2 2 inhibitors, more precisely in those patients who are having ankle brachial index of less than 0.5, and also there are inherent issues related to uke di glycemic diabetic ketoacidosis in uh, in patients using SGLT2 inhibitors. Metformin is okay at any form; you can use it. This drug should be continued with uh, insulin therapy. DPP-4 inhibitors are again, are good, good drugs. They also improve your wound healing. For sulfonylureas, you have to look at the hypoglycemia risk. If you are using basal dose of ins basal insulin, then you can decrease the dose of sulfonylureas because of increased potency to decrease postprandial hyperglycemia with the use of basal insulin. But if you are using premix insulin, probably you have to reduce the dose or you have to omit sulfonylureas. Regarding TZDs, these are good drug for insulin sensitization, but important thing is that you have to reduce the dose because of there is increased risk of uh, pedal edema or fluid retention with TZDs plus insulin. So I pr preferably go to 7.5 or 15 milligram of TZDs with insulin. Next slide. So now this is glucophenotype that which type, which insulin to be started with OHA, whether it is a premix insulin or is a basal insulin, it is a index of postprandial glucose excretion. If it, the postprandial glucose excretion from the baseline is more than 74, you start with a rapid acting insulin or it is better to have basal plus regimen. If you are having between 40 to 74 milligram increase in postprandial glucose excursion, probably you are requiring premix insulin or if it is less than 40 milligram excursion only, then basal insulin will do the job. Next slide. Dr. Again, Sorry, there is a... Please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, next slide, Thank sir. You, sir. Yes, sir. Bringing objectivity to choice, then if uh, this, this can be again, uh, postprandial fasting index can also be used. Now for recently, we are using fourth generation ultra long acting basal insulin analog, which has got a half life of around 25, 25 hours, duration of action more than 42 hours and very, very less variability, both intra uh, dose and inter person, inter person variability. Next slide. So you can see that the variability of this deglutactase is very, very low in comparison to insulin, both insulin glargin U100 and U300. Also, that this drug achieves maximum concentration, stable concentration, uh, 
uh, after achieving it remains stable 90 to 20 uh, more than 90 to 120 so concentration remains stable for up to 25 hours in comparison to your other basal insulin analog like lentus next slide so there is a lot of peak and trough variability in glargen so in comparison to diglutec so diglutec has got much more smoother achievement of glycemic control and maximum and that has been replicated in various trials, leading on to decreasing overall nocturnal sphere hyperglycemia in comparison to various uh, basal insulin and both NPH and uh, glargin. So there is wide range of patient population already tried with insulin diglutac. Next slide. It can be given to elderly population and all stages of renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction. So there is this PK. Uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic of diglutac remains absolutely stable in all stages as in all ages of the patients, all renal and hepatic impairment of patients. So this, uh, uh, it has got very simple, easy way to titrate that you start with 10 units of ins uh, insulin diglutac with OAD and there is weekly titration. And if you are using already basal insulins, then it is unit to unit transfer. If you are using premix and insulins, then 70% part of basal insulin of total can be combined and decreased by 20%. Then this is a diglutec dose. Very important, the flexibility is between eight hours to 40 hours of dosing can be used. And this drug, diglutec has got benefit over other basal insulin. It leads to effective glycemic control significant low rates of hypoglycemia, significantly lower daily insulin dose, lower monitoring cost is required and offers dose timing flexibility of eight to 40 hours. Next slide. So it answers lot many your questions, lot many problems has been taken care of with this ultra long acting uh, 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 basal insulin. Next slide. Again, we are using another advanced and recent approach in bolus insulin that is more or less mimicking physiological meal related time uh, insulin release from beta cells of pancreas. This is insulin FIASP. They have added ne niacinamide as an absorption modifier and also added as a L arginine as a added to stability of monomers. It leads to, in, next slide. Onset Please of action. Please conclude your yes, sir. Uh, talk, sir. Fine, sir, fine. So it's a, onset of action is very rapid within five minutes onset of action, peak, peak action is seen within, within one hour, duration of action is three hours. So this has got a very rapid onset of action, very rapid control of hyperglycemia and also the offset of action is 14 minutes earlier than aspart insulin. Next slide. So with FIASP insulin, you can very easily mimic the ideal postprandial control with right dose at right time. Now, earlier we were using, uh, this is the sliding scale insulin, but next slide. With sliding scale insulin, there is always an assumption that you are not taking care with your basal segment. And it's a knee jerk response to hyperglycemia, roller coaster type of uh, control can be seen. So obviously you are going hyper in between hyper and hypoglycemia, next slide. So the best thing for a, a patient who is in non-critical situation, you go with basal bolus plus correction bolus therapy. Next slide. So the basal bolus regimen can be taken, started with the 0.2.3 unit per kg body weight, depending on the body weight of the patient, depending upon the EGFR of the patient, depending upon the age of the patient, and also depending upon the baseline blood glucose level. So next slide. So with the total daily dose calculated, you divide between 50, 50, 50 is a basal and 50 is the bolus and 50% of bolus can be divided into three boluses with the three meals. Next slide. So now inpatient, the inpatient, those patients who are in the ICU, here the dictum is next slide, where you are having organ dysfunction, the remember the target is 140 to 180, dictum is to start the insulin infusion. When to start, it is when, when you have got more than two readings up getting above 180. Next slide. So there are different, different protocols, but I always say, next slide, the protocol, which is the best for you, it is easily ordered, effective, maintains blood glucose within definite range of your overall, uh, and also, the best protocol that which is easily understood, everybody working in your ICU, staff nurse, medical officer are familiar, not much mathematics, not much calculations with minimal risk of hypos, easy to up titrate and easy to down titrate. So you have to formulate your own, own insulin protocols for your in ICU patients. Next slide. So what we follow, we follow an updated ELA 
insulin pro infusion protocol. Here you make a solution in your injector that is one ml of uh, fluid that is 0.9 percent normal normal saline and one and one unit per ml of insulin is being made and the, the insulin pump is increment in decrease or increase up with the rate of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1 or 1.5 unit per hour to maintain a target of 140 to 180. So with repeatedly blood sugar testing of every two hour, two hourly blood sugar testing, if stabilized, then you can go for four hourly or sometime delay the testing also can be if it is absolutely stabilized. Initiation of dose is what is the baseline, basal blood baseline blood glucose if it is 325 you divide by 100 it gives you 3.25 round out round off is 3.5 so the starting dose is 3.5 unit uh, start starting uh, the bolus and then start with 3.5 unit per hour as an infusion rate and the target is to achieve 60 to 70 milligram decrease per hour and two hourly blood sugar monitoring has to be done Next slide. Increment of the this scale has to be done by 0.5 to 1 or 1.5 unit per hour. Next slide. Please conclude, Next. Dr. Sussi. Yes, sir, but last slide. Oh. Next slide. So this is the now for smooth landing, we must ensure injection of either regular human insulin one hour before, as part 20 minutes before, or fast two minutes before stopping IV infusion, or two hours before give a basal insulin therapy. So this is to overlap between IV insulin and the subcutaneous insulin. So uh, friend, you calculate the total daily dose having average infusion rate for the previous six to eight hours stabilized patient and divide, multiply by four to three, uh, four or three to get 24 hour total daily dose and take 60 to 80% of total daily dose and convert into basal bolus coverage. Summarizing in patient with glycine, Patient with diabetic foot syndrome, glycemia management is an at most important. Classify the foot ulcer based on ITSA guideline. Carefully choose insulin at initiation, basal or premix. Adjust oral agents as indicated, up titrate and intensify as needed to achieve glycemic targets. Avoid sliding scale. Infusion for critically ill patient is mandatory. Multiple subcutaneous infusion injections for those accepting oral feeds. Titration based upon individual characteristics. Analog insulin, both basal and bolus, have definitely edged over traditional insulin, especially in efficacy, safety, and convenience. Thank you, friends. Just invite Dr. Uh, uh, Saxena. Dr. Ramchandani, please invite Dr. Saxena. Dr. Saxena? Rajnish? Uh, thank you, Dr. Suri. And yes. now uh, for a wonderful talk on the insulin, analog insulins. Now we are uh, coming to the last lecture of the today's CME by Dr. Rajnish Saxena and the balancing efficacy and safety. I think there was some internet problem or some uh, electricity problem. That's why the, uh, he stopped the slides. Now, can uh, I start now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes start. Please start. Uh, oh, oh, thank you very much, Dr. GD. First of all, I am very much thankful to Dr. K.K. Parik sir for sparing his valuable time from his busy schedule. Uh, as you all know, during COVID era, there is lockdown, curfew, and lack of transportation facilities there. So it is very difficult for a patient to consult doctor in person or face to face. So distancing, sanitization, stay at home with proper use of mask is mandatory for preventing contamination from SARS coronavirus. So we are compelled to use telemedicine. And in last one and a half month, bombardment of telemedicine webinars are there. But I will discuss only important points which are important in our day-to-day -day practice. So everything changed since years, not the touch, because patient fit deserve the best and for us, every fit is patient. So in Corona era, we are giving consultation online, but what is telemedicine? We have to understand the according to WHO, telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of disease and injuries, research and evolution, and the continuing education of healthcare workers with the aim of advancing the health of individuals and communities. 
so in uh, lockdown phase patient is unable to contact doctor so telemedicine is very important but there are few lacunas for these lacunas we will handle the patient how we can save ourselves first of all we will discuss the scope of telemedicine because in kurges an important route of providing health services accepted and guidance given by mca on 25th march 2020 the guidelines are meant for registered medical practitioner under the indian medical council act 1956 and these guidelines cover norms and standards of the registered medical practitioner to consult patient via telemedicine and telemedicine should be included all the channels of communication that is audio video text or digital data exchange these all are important for giving consultation the exclusion criteria according to uh, the guideline given by mcir data management system involvement and standards and interoperability these are excluded from the guidelines second use of digital technology to conduct surgical or invasive procedure remotely with the help of telemedicine we cannot perform surgeries or the in non -inv or, or the invasive procedure in remote area the other exclusive criteria are the telehealth such as research and evolution and continuing education of healthcare workers so the data which are coming from the tele consultation should not be used for the um, research purposes this also exclude the consultation outside the jurisdiction of the india so telemedicine consultation can be given to the indian citizen who are residing inside the country the classification of telemedicine there are four types of basic uh, telemedicine procedure first one is the according to mode of communication it include the video mainly telemedicine faculty with apps video on chat whatsapp and audio mainly phone voip or apps etc the text based include the telemedicine and based application mainly general messaging text not only from the uh, email but also from the whatsapp google facebook twitter etc the asynchronous is the other in this asynchronous mode of communication patient can send his reports via email or fax second is the according to timing of information transmitted that is real time video audio text interaction when patient in contact with the doctor then doctor directly interact with the patient and this is the real time information transmitted and second when the asynchronous exchange of relevant information that is when doctor advise some investigation and patient send the investigation to the rmp that is through email or fax these are the asynchronous exchange third type include the purpose of consultation that is first consultation with the any rmp for diagnosis for treatment for health education or counseling and follow up consultation with the same rmp we can give consultation only those patient who consulted previously with us but within last 6 month of the duration the according to individuals involved the there are patient to registered medical practitioner consultation in this patient directly contact registered medical practitioner for taking the consultation regarding his disease then care giver to the rmp third one is the rmp to rmp like tele radiology tele pathology or tele ophthalmology in our day to day practice we are taking picture image from the fundus of the eye then sent to the service operator this is called as rmp to rmp tele consultation then health worker to rmp in this health worker is in contact with registered medical practitioner and he will take consultation he will take history examination of the patient and convey all the finding to the registered medical practitioner the guidelines for the telemedicine in india there are seven element first one is the context context include the every patient every case every medical condition is different so context is different for different consultation second one is the identification of the registered medical practitioner and patient because before taking the consultation patient should identify the practitioner ki what is the degree of the practitioner what was the qualification experience 
and doctor should know who is the patient third one is the mode of communication whether audio video or text then consent taking is also very important then type of consultation patient evaluation and lastly the patient management patient management include not only medicine but also dietary and exercise advices and investigation which are advised for the further management of the disease the consultation between patient and rmp includes first consultation and subsequent or follow up consultation in first consultation patient is consulting with the rmp for the first time or during last 6 month he consulted for the same problem if previously the patient consult for different health condition then he will be again treated as the first consultation the process of tele consultation include start of a tele medicine consultation for first consultation action in this patient contact the doctor online then patient identification and consent is very important then the patient is identified by the registered medical practitioner and quick assessment of the symptoms of the patient is done by the doctor then next step exchange of information for patient evaluation that is for example is patient is suffering from diabetes mellitus then blood sugar level blood pressure and the other parameters like uh, any event of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia then doctor assess the condition and evaluate and then he will manage accordingly and write down the prescription similarly in follow up consultation there will be a face to face consultation is not necessary in chronic disease like asthma diabetes hypertension and epilepsy so in this case patient can directly contact the doctor but within 6 month after the first consultation not after 6 month within 6 month then start of telemedicine consultation for follow up if rmp accept the patient then he will start consultation secondly identification of the patient is also important at this time and consent is also very important because patient if contact first then he already give consent to take the consultation from the patient from the doctor then quick assessment for emergency condition if patient is not uh, manage at home then doctor will decide if whether what will be the situation and how we can manage so he will advise first aid and counseling of the patient is also very important then doctor will refer the patient for suitable center for further management of the condition if patient is not in emergency condition then he should taking an examination findings are assessed by the doctor then in, he will exam he will assess the investigation report past records and manage the patient accordingly similarly important it to during the telemedicine consultation you all know all about the telemedicine consultation because in last one and half month every company companies coming with different app uh, online app or the tele consultation app so you all know all about the tele consultation but i will give important point which are important for uh, our day to day clinical practice first of all consent by patient is important patient con contact first indicate that he approve for consultation he give approval of the consent and then identification of patient is important if doctor contact patient first then it is not considered as the consent from the patient so patient should contact first secondly online course for registered medical practitioner for practice of telemedicine is essential according to mci guidelines course should be completed within 3 years of notification of this law tele consultation is guidelines given by mci but not a law it is not a law it is only guidelines so civil consumer and criminal suits can be faced by rmp in future because only with inspection you are prescribing medication so always be careful at the time of prescription the categories of medicines that can be prescribed by a tele consultation will be as notified in consultation with the central government from time to time only drug listed in o means otc drugs a drugs and b drugs can be prescribed the prohibited drugs that is scheduled drug scheduled extra of drugs and cosmetic act and rules 
or any narcotic and psychotropic substance listed in the narcotic drug and psychotropic substance act 1985 cannot be prescribed by the doctor if they prescribe they will be uh, shoot as a criminal negligence case then medical ethics data privacy and confidentiality and other guidelines should be followed by the rmp is it very important always maintain the data trail documentation of consultation and other record keeping is very important for prescribe period as court of law these are important finding now i discuss the simplified guidelines on personal protection in opd and in ipd practice issued by ministry of health and family welfare on 1st may 2020 for diabetologist or diabetes clinics according to these guidelines in opd department at health desk and registration center there is mild risk so activity is there is information to the patient or registration there is very mild risk so triple layer medical mask and latest examination gloves are recommended for the health desk persons if they are sitting on the health desk then proper sanitization of the all the patient and the health desk person is very important physical distancing is to be maintained by health desk individuals with the patients and doctor chamber there is also mild risk in case of diabetes resist clinic so triple layer medical mask or n95 mask with latest examination gloves is sufficient for preventing contamination but no aerosol generating procedure should be allowed in the doctor chamber in the pharmacy counter at of opd department distribution of drug is there done by the pharmacist risk is very mild so triple layer medical mask with latex examination gloves are advised but frequent use of hand sanitizer is advised to the pharmacist with gloves in ipd in operation theater in diabetic food there is mild oper minor operation theater or operation theater surgery is done so moderate risk is there triple layer medical mask mainly with n95 mask and pp should be wear by the surgeons or diabetic foot specialist face shield with style latex gloves is advised and they should wear the goggles if it's already OT, if already ot is type is there then they should wear pp n95 mask and sanitize at sanitization there is only triple layer medical mask and latex examination gloves is advised these all are the guide, uh, advices given by the medical and health department of government of india i will not go into the detail of these these already discussed by the doctor doctor the guy summarized with this slide that every diabetic and food clinic should follow all necessary measures to stop spreading of contamination and safety of all healthcare provider and paramedics those who are at risk should be identified early and isolate or quarantine them according to guidelines given by the ministry of health and family welfare always save the limb through patient education and at this crucial time of covid-19 pandemic telemedicine is important solution to prevent amputation and lastly telemedicine is important tool but use with caution because little carelessness might create a lot of legal problem in future thank you very much Uh, thank you, Doctor Rajni Saxena. Uh, Doctor uh, Ram Chandani, yes, take sir. questions very fast because yes, there is no time. Ah, definitely, ah, definitely. So at least there should be discussion and interaction. Those who are attending, they yes. want some queries. So please go through earliest as possible as uh, be brief. And I uh, request the speakers to answer in very brief mode. Yeah. Yes. So, Thank you to all the speakers. I think there are a lot of questions uh, already there. So I first start uh, with Dr. Suri. That uh, they, you already say that IPA. The meaning is I prevent amputation. The, the aim of this IPA and every diabetologist is to prevent the amputation, early detection and amputation. So definitely there is a role of uh, diabetic uh, foot educator. Uh, so how really? because diabetic uh, foot problem or diabetic ulcer is a uh, very cost very costly affair and it take times so how in in our setup 
how we can treat the patient with minimal minimum uh, financial burden to the patient because it require multi specialty uh, if any patient come with the diabetic foot ulcer so how we can treat this patient with minimal cost or offloading how we can offload in a in in, in small setup like where there is not uh, very uh, Uh, all the new equipments are there so how we can offload and how we can treat this with uh, cost effective treatment yeah, it's a it's a very good question and a very uh, appropriate question see i prevent amputation that is a slogan uh, given for indian foot artery association and we are now going for a uh, logo and the slogan uh, registration we have already done mr anand suri from hyderabad he is working on that this is mainly a slogan which has been given because we really need to prevent amputation at the basic level at the primary center and in india the primary center is at a gp level as a physician or diabetologist level so two important things every physician can do as i said in my slide one is early detection of neuropathy second is early detection of pbd now with that our educator nurse educator or our physiotherapist or our male nurse female nurse or you yourself can give basic education to the patient what type of footwear to use how to take care of the nails how to take care of the interdigital fungal infection how to take care not to use any hot water bottle or basic things we all know so that is first line of prevention second is if an infection occurs and patient is coming to you with a small blister or something use of hydrogel is very important as i showed you in debridement slide hydrogel is worth 70 rupees to 200 rupees so every city of india has hydrogels like silver x steel hydrogel lot of things are available so that can be done to the day. no antiseptic dressing should be applied on the foot of the patient basic offloading thing is ki trying to advise them to use soft soles inside their own sandals open velcro sandals can be worn sometimes diabetic shoes or diabetic front offloading heel offloading they can't afford it so you can use evaso pads make a cut out like a u pad and you can apply that at the first mtp joint fifth mtp inter between wherever the ulcer is there so these type of basic offloading can be advised to the patient so this is a at a basic level when you think he has called diffuse peripheral vascular disease abi index is less then role of vascular surgeon has to become or he has to be referred to the hospital for admission if the infection is spreading necrotizing fasciitis is occurring cellulitis is occurring uh, uh, internal abscess is developing so that a later stage at a first stage neuropathy pvd proper education footwear of loading this is the basic thing at a very cost effective hardly it will charge about 500 600 rupees to the patient and we can do that and we have seen in our clinic at a basic level that with this i can prevent amputation in our diabetic patients dr suri i want to know something hello Doctor yeah. Suri, can you hear me? Yes. Actually, Doctor Suri, you are you are uh, stressing over the education, but how IPA is spreading education of doctors and paramedics in our country? Because no. education of paramedics is also very important because all doctors are very busy in their busy schedule. So how they can spare time for educating the patients? In IPA, we are running a FTFM course, Fellowship in Diabetic Foot course, management course. along with that now we have started a course which is a short term course for 3 months for a paramedic and now any paramedic in any part of the country can online connect to us and we will give him some modules how to do dressing how to do offloading what are the basic uh, dressings to be applied basic gels to be applied and how to assess like a plaster of paris cast now you if you are looking for an orthopedic surgeon for do your paramedic can make it for you and we we will train your paramedic for do that pop cast front offloading heel offloading cut outs in the shoes so that three month course is available which we are working dr rajneesh dr sanjay kale and dr ravi kamipri from usa dr uh, uh, daria is also working into this and we have other people from dr San sanjay uh, sanjay sharma from uh, bangalore dr manish from maharashtra so we have devised devised this course for a paramedic and that paramedic is the most important part in our clinic because if he is trained to this lot of your work is been done even a endocrinologist is working he has diabetic foot infection we know that he he doesn't have time to see those things so spe special care for the foot can be done by the paramedic and we have a course for that it's a three month course you can log in directly and he can come to our clinic here in delhi in bangalore in ajmer and in kanpur four places he can go and he can have training for four to five days 
Thank you. Uh, in four to five days training is sufficient for a diabetic educator to your place uh, or? No, sufficient. But before that, he has to complete all the modules. There okay. are seven okay. modules. He has to complete all the modules and then he completes first module. Then second module will open. He completes that. Then third module. He cannot go directly to fourth and fifth module. So th that is there. And after that, four to five days is sufficient. So how much is the fee structure of that uh, course for that educator? 25,000. 25,000, including yeah. uh, all seven modules and everything. everything. Uh, good. It's a very good initiative because without educator, you cannot uh, definitely prevent the neuropathy. And once neuropathy or ulcer is there, definitely it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So it's a definitely yes, very good. No profitability in this course because a lot of faculty is involved. Even the course material, we are sending CDs and a booklet and it's online. So the online is costing us too much into this. So there's no... Uh, this is absolutely below par. We are doing in Indian Podiatry Association. There's no profit, zero profit uh, for paramedics. Excellent, yes. sir. Because entire IPA uh, committee and pattern is here. So uh, uh, there, uh, it's my idea that there's a uh, national level NDP program is running by uh, the RSSG are also planning to run. And they are planning to run the course for uh, type 1 diabetes and uh, uh, telemedicine and for uh, they are planning to make the centers in the every state like center of reference center of excellence why did you start in banner of ip because there are hardly one or two or three centers in in rajasthan or in every state because every once we saw the diabetic foot ulcer we used to refer the patient so why, why we are not able to manage in our setup why we not because because we don't have a complete team or we don't don't have the educator to educate them or to prevent them so why don't and diabetic foot is present in every part of the country every city every clinic every doctor sees these patients so why don't you plan on this uh, thing uh, i think dr parik is here so i request dr parik to kindly comment on this kindly have some kind word yes. about how we can uh, make this uh, uh, how to prevent this problem and how to tackle this problem in future no we can reach to the uh, physicians and clinicians who come across every day with the diabetic foot. So we must reach, we must organize CME programs at that level, even at the peripheral level also. So you can uh, just uh, appoint somebody in some district, say Rajasthan chapter. Now the president, the, the chairperson of Rajasthan chapter must uh, try to uh, go and uh, organize CME programs at the rural level and other things. So that we can control our awareness and education is the most important. Awareness and education to the clinician, to the pilot practitioners, to the physicians is very, very important because <clears throat> the biggest thing is clinical inertia. We, this is what I told you, we never examine foot, mostly. For me also, when I see a diabetic uh, patient, I don't examine his feet. So this is very important because we don't take it seriously. We take it seriously when patient develops a uh, diabetic foot. So we must have awareness program and CMEs at a district level and a peripheral level. Definitely, yes. sir. Definitely. In Definitely. Rajasthan, even uh, I think Dr. Suri will, I will discuss with Dr. Suri about this. How can we uh, plan this uh, project in uh, state level and uh, national level also. Now, I, 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 I the, my, my next question is from Dr. Ravi Kamipali. And uh, in India, in uh, diabetic foot, sometimes there is an infection, or uh, sometimes, or uh, most of the time, there is a secondary infection. So it's difficult to do culture and all these things in every patient. So, what are the drug of choice what are the empirical antibiotics should be treat, started uh, in for initial stage and once you saw the patient of uh, diabetic foot with secondary infection so without doing all the culture and all the sensitivity what were the empirical antibiotics should be started i mean like can i can i take the question oh, yeah, Ravi. Yes. Okay. yes Ravi. Uh, yeah B basically basically the idea of the local situation dr suri can explain better but uh, what I can say is it is number one, we have to do the right thing. Right thing is when you suppose the common thing is we have to think first and look next and then figure it out and then treat. 
Now, if you want to say because of the cost, we are not doing it, that's a different story. It just behoves on the system, the healthcare system and the doctors to figure it out. Now, we can blindly do it or the, the common basic thing, you know, debridement, exudate management and infection control. So if there is dead tissue, remove it, you know, and, and try to control the exudate. But then there is, uh, from an infection standpoint, if you debulk the wound, that is major prop process. But also with this, we are not addressing the root cause of nutrition, the vascular aspect. So all this inflammation and react to oxygen species and all this happen because of not taking care of the root cause. So we need to address better sugar control, but I should say better insulin control. And the problem with our uh, culture and the medical system there is, we don't have any fasting insulins being done except, except when you know, we are trying to say if it is a pancreatic tumor or some, some other conditions, rarely some endocrinologists do it. But fasting insulin level has to be stressed more. And then also trying to understand that infection, the bugs are everywhere. It's like, it's like you know, this, this coronavirus has been there. I mean, it just, it's just jumped into a new thing. The idea is we should not be afraid of the bugs. We have to improve the immunity of the system. Now, then we can fight the infection. Then in the top of it, local antimicrobials, like you know the hypochlorous acid, we can use it. And if it is infected, then, then we, can, uh, we can do the Dakin solution initially. Then we can figure out what antibiotics, that's where at the end is when I, I really give antibiotics. Now, I mean, like when you're frequently seeing the patient every week, really, I don't think antibiotics do much, except you know, you can empirically start the patient on something like, you know, Augmentin, uh, like uh, Zyvox or uh, Cipro or whatever. I mean, depending upon the color, sometimes, you know, if it is a green color, you can call it is Pseudomonas, you know. So, but at the end of the day, if you're not following the first tenets of the thing and stress, and that's where uh, Dr. Saxena was talking about uh, telemedicine. Telemedicine and a high touch solution is what is going to change this whole paradigm. And we have at IPA, Dr. Ramchandani, I want to tell you one more thing. We have been working on a telemedicine solution and I, mean, I know it is not easy. And I've been, I've been stressing and doing this and I've presented on uh, uh, telemedicine aspects at the pre previous IPA meetings and our meetings in Rajasthan too. I did it wherein we try to stress and I'm, I'm myself trying to help develop that solution. And through IPA, we will bring that solution. And through IPA, we will help uh, the, 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 your type 1 diabetes. I'm thank, very passionate about trying you, to help you, type 1 thank diabetes. You. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah Dr. Suri. Actually, Ravi, there is one question from Mr. Dr. Rohit. Can a glyphosate is related to toe amputation? Is it right or wrong? Or whether we can prescribe SGLT2 in uh, diabetic good patient or we can... No, contraindication. No, no. I mean, the, the idea was recently, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Saxena was talking about not uh, prescribing it. And ideally, we should not. Uh, but <clears throat> it just comes down to what we are trying to achieve. Because sometimes with SGLT2 and uncontrolled diabetic, you can have uh, uh, euglycemic uh, ketosis and then the whole idea is, you know, they're educating the patient. To, why are you peeing out urine when you can reduce your, uh, sorry, when, why are you peeing out your glucose when you can reduce your glucose intake? I don't see a reason for SGLT2 if we are able to help patients understand their blood sugar better or what happens when they eat carbs. So it just comes down to understanding like maybe continuous glucose monitoring or food tracking, seeing how the food response, how, how, how the, what they eat causes the glucose response. I mean, like nowadays, I think many people are using continuous glucose monitoring too. So, so it's, it may, it may counter, uh, can a glyphosate is contraindicated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. And can we have a Dr. Sandeep Suri's comments on that? Sir, actually, can I, uh, Audible? I am audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Audible. Sir, actually, the amputation risk came into the picture when we had Canvas program. Yes. Canvas and Canvas R both showed there is a two-fold increased risk of 
amputation in these patients with canaglyphosin further trial trials was C, with cvot previous was amparag then further was uh, this uh, declaratimi both were not showing this amputation risk was there but they were not showing any amputation but credence trial that included those patient who are having renal impairment also credence trial also didn't show any amputation but the uh, thing was that the incredence trial they removed such type of patients who are having very high risk or those who are showing risk factors for amputation so still the jury is not out for canaglyphosin it is probably the molecule related things that has happened also amputation was so, shown by r2 glyphosin in this uh, vertis trial there was increased risk of amputation and also in phase 3 trial with r2 glyphosin again there was an amputation risk probably we are dealing in between the class there are molecules which are different now with vertis trial again you are not showing any benefit in three point base again there was no benefit in renal end points only in heart failure there is benefit so probably we are dealing with different molecules in a similar class so there is a black box warning especially for canaglyphosin other you have to weigh but those patient who are having active foot ulcer high risk patients who has been already amputated patient having ankle brachial index 0.7 less than 0.7 please don't give these drugs these can lead to some litigation problem also so the many things are out in the press so you can use safer medications and also dietary therapy of dr ravi thank, thank you. you thank you dr ramchandani are yes. there any questions yeah one the... or two one or two questions sir yes, let, let, let dr suri what dr suri yeah. says yeah, yeah dr suri Yeah. Yes, one or two questions can be taken, sir. I have got one point to the initial question of antibiotics. Yeah. See, in diabetic foot care, whenever a patient comes to us in the clinic, even if we don't have cultures or we don't have culture reports, by the time the culture reports come, think of the snake. In the snake, if we cut the head of the snake, the whole body is doesn't uh, uh, harmful to us. The head of the snake is harmful. In diabetic foot ulcer, the head of the snake is Staph aureus and Streptococcus. so if you hit your antibiotics to both these organisms the head of the snake is cut off and the rest of the body we will take care of itself by other antibiotics by the time the culture comes so this you should always remember this is one of the very cost effective measure in our clinical practices by the time you have sent the abscess or the tissue for the culture so head of the snake method in diabetic foot infection we should always keep in the back of the mind that's all uh-huh. Thank- Yes, Dr. Ramkandani sir. Thank you. And very, very practical or layman question. Briefly. Should uh, every briefly. every diabetic patient should wear a footwear because uh, when whenever patient come to us, there's sub sub pairo me takli boi hai, and everybody says you go to buy the uh, uh, foot of uh, footwear of that shoes or uh, uh, some com- company. So is this really useful for every diabetic patient to uh, wear such footwear from? uh some company or something is to be done no, by no, no sir no sorry yes no sir the only thing is what advice you have to give to the patient is ki whatever shoes or sandals or chappals you are wearing you should all or you are going to purchase they should be soft from in, inside where your foot is there it should be broad from the front so that you don't have any friction at the first mtp joint or the fifth mtp joint and it if the sandals are there the velcro should be little loose or the shoe is there shoe should be one size bigger or uh, appropriate of size we don't recommend going to any particular shoe or any particular brand because we know that cost for the patient will increase so initial stage at a neuropathy just proper advice about footwear is sufficient enough we don't need to send, sell any brands to them that should be the goal. thank you uh we have uh, our secretary dr puneet saxena and uh, dr darya is from sms medical college when uh, this chapter was started i still remember dr sudhir bandari sir was there and we planned to start a diabetic clinic in sms medical college but unfortunately and this covid happened and in last three months uh, the i think there so i i am i requesting dr puneet what they are planning to do and one more thing that you discuss about the painful diabetic neuropathy was most mostly in diabetic patient patient is just uh, moderate to severe neuropathy and there is no pain the commonest presentation is painless so i think we should uh, uh, train our residents in medical college or house surgeons or all these uh, about to foot examinations since once they will develop the, develop the habit 
to see the food to just simple examination and that protocol should be followed because dr sudhir mundari sir also told in that and that uh, you know in, in their lecture that we should train our residents and all the students from their uh, during their mbbs or md courses okay. so what is your uh, in your medical college is there any you just uh, on your uh, audios dr punit yeah dr punit punit saxena please audio is not here audio not is there okay dr darya okay. is there right. yeah, right. can you hear me now yeah yeah yes. yeah so it was planned that we are going to run a full fledged diabetes food clinic in our institute and in the various uh, instruments and uh, but uh, unfortunately the covid happened and the process has been stalled and the other part which dr ramchandani has rightly highlighted that sensitization of resident doctors and the undergraduate students is more important rather than developing a full fledged diabetes clinic because uh, it's a, if you do a bedside examination such a large number of diabetic patients are coming to this institute in opd and ipd and we are running specialty clinics also and besides that there is a full fledged uh, endocrine department also which is seeing so large number of patients and surgery department plastic surgery we all are working in tandem and uh, probably when we develop a full fledged diabetes clinic we will have a common sitting of doctors from all these faculties together to address the problem in the meantime the diabetic foot uh, awareness program and education about it has already been started with the undergraduates and the postgraduate students in the respective units and we have uh, plan to bring it to the main curriculum in near future that's good that, uh, that's great uh, dr purit uh, so are there any questions here no sir there are no questions now or you can if can there is any query uh, 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 in the last last by email to us sir they can send on the ipf website the right, email they can send questions over yeah please note down the uh, email ipa footcare.org so uh, finally uh, i uh, con conclude and i, I thanks uh, all the delegates all the speakers and the chairs and especially vocard entire team of vocard uh, uh, mr riyasat and nitin khanna mr gorav and ranjan and our chief lcs sri because i always uh, say chief lcs sri sri vishnu for uh, conducting this uh, uh, website ipa cme uh, and finally i request uh, dr ap suri to uh, have a word of thanks and conclude the session thank you thank you uh, so much to all the delegates for taking out time from this uh, covid season i we know that slowly and slowly the clinics and hospitals are opening up but i thank you and i think a uh, lot of uh, registrations for there a lot of people have joined in this five uh, lectures which we have done thank you to all the delegates thanks to dr parik sir for uh, uh, taking out time and being the head of this webinar under his patronship we have been able to procure this and spread this uh, word of education in diabetic foot care uh, thanks to dr sandeep suri sir dr uh, ramchandani sir dr rajini saxena my best colleague from ipa dr ravi saxena uh, ravi kamipuli from usa is taken out time early in the morning dr ss dari and dr puni saxena which are i think one of two stalwarts in jaipur and under their leadership with dr prajapan chandani sir we started this rajasthan chapter so it is the first initiative of ipa with rajasthan chapter and haryana chapter together we have devised this webinar and we hope that god will give us the strength to do that with other chapters also and the word of thanks to vocard team the whole mr khanna and other people who have taken out time helped us to how to uh, educate us how to share the slides and other things and uh, they have been have an it's a very successful uh, webinar thank you uh, 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 thanks to all the team and uh, everyone over here thank, thank you, you very much thank you very uh, much dr parik uh, yes uh, i think it is one of the best webinar the all the speakers have done a great job excellent lectures there was a shortage of time but excellent lecture excellent review of uh, uh, diabetic foot and i must congratulate dr suri dr rajesh sakshana for organizing such a wonderful webinar mm -hmm. and go card also because what i am getting the feedback from the attendees that 100% excellent 
So must congratulate and compliment Dr. Suri and Dr. Rajesh Saxena and all the speakers, those, done, those who have done a great job and by um, giving a good update or uh, updating our clinicians. So I think uh, we can have uh, one, I may say Mr. Vishnu of Fokart uh, to uh, congratulate him also. And I Thank request you, him to have a second webinar like that so that, I mean, this is a very learning place. It is a very learning stage also, updating our clinicians. So more and more people will join. So thank you very much, Vokard. Thank you, thank Dr. You, Suri. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you sir. Ram Chandani, very yeah. nice moderation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Parikh, sir. Thanks thank you for the thank kind words. And, uh, and uh, we will definitely do the second one with your uh, blessings and with all the patterns of... Uh, Wonderful. I mean, we are satisfied. I mean, I'm satisfied. Wonderful. I mean, thank interaction you. also, uh, lectures also, all lecture stalwarts of uh, diabetes and diabetic food. With your guidance, definitely we will do not only not only another one, sir. We will may do many other. Uh... Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you sir. Rajan, thank Rajan, you. please conclude the. Yeah, I am very thankful to IPA team for giving us chance to do this webinar, and special thanks to Dr. Pari as well as Dr. Ramchandani. So he, they have moderated the session. So being a VOCA team, I am very thankful to these doctors, especially Dr. Dr. A.P. Suri, Dr. Sandeep Suri, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Punish Saxena, as well as Dr. S.S. Duria for spare some time. And I am very special thanks to Dr. Ravi from USA, who has given giving a special time in morning and participating in the webinar. So thank you very much. And thank you to Riyasat also for doing this, organizing this webinar also. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nitin. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Thank Goodbye. You. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Chalo. Ram, Bahut Ram, Ram, Ram. Ram. Nice. Your lecture was very good. Thank you, sir. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Ramchandani has uh, very nicely conducted. Thank you, Suri Sahib. Your lecture was wonderful. Excellent. You, Dr. Ravi also, he spoke so well. Ravi, I must congratulate him for his lecture. Dr. Uh, Suri also. Uh, yes. Sandeep Suri, he also spoke very well. Dr. Ram Chandani and Dr. Saxena, Dr. Puneet Saxena, Rajneesh, and everybody spoke very well. We need your blessing, sir. We need your thank blessing. You, thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Vokar team. Thank, thank you, you Vokar team. Thank you, sir. Get back to the next uh, program. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we thank come you. to an end now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.